Good afternoon. Today is March 19th, 2018, and we are honored that you have chosen to spend a little bit of your time with us tonight. We hope that you find it profitable. And uh, so it has been the tradition of this board and thousands of boards across the country to begin with a couple of things. First of all, we're going to have what's called a solemnizing prayer, and that is uh, for the commissioners as we seek to uh, look for wisdom as we make decisions on behalf of the county, and after that we'll have the pledge. So commissioners, if you'll join me, we'll get started. Lord, we're honored to be here tonight, and we thank you for our county commissioners and the work they do, and we pray you'll give them the wisdom they need uh, tonight. I'm, I'm sure they've already prepared themselves for this meeting, and I thank for that. I thank for their dedication that they have for, for what they do. I thank for all those who are gathered here tonight, Lord, to conduct business, to hear business, Lord. We pray you will be with them, Lord. We pray you'll bless Rowan County and help us to always make the right decisions. Thank for this opportunity that we have today to gather, to gather this night, Lord. Again, give us the wisdom we all need. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Chaplain Taylor. As always, appreciate you being here. Would like to recognize uh, some special guests with us. Uh, we have Mayor Jim Gobble from uh, from Spencer here. Would you like to stand and introduce your group? Thank you, Greg. Yes. This is all the David Lamar and all of me, Mike and my wife. And my wife. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim, I'm going to give you another shot at that to introduce them in the proper order. <laughs> go, go ahead, Jim. You're, you're, you're a quick study. That, that's good. Well, uh, we, we welcome you all here tonight. Thank you for being here. All right. All right, commissioners, uh, let's see. I sent you guys an email about an item uh, that's been pl placed in front of you. Uh, for Opportunity Zone. We're going to add that. Um, I've got it. I was going to put it at, at uh, item 4A. Uh, Madam Clerk, am I allowed to, to do that since we have quasi-judicial quasi hearings? Does that need to go after the hearings? Okay. Where's uh, Ed? Where's Ed? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and put that at item 4A, if that's okay with you all, uh, because Ed um, is item 4, and then he's done, so we don't want to make him sit around a whole long while. Is there, are there any other additions or deletions? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to pull item N and put it on the regular uh, agenda, please. All right, uh, we'll make that, uh, uh, let's see, let's make it uh, 10A. Is that okay with you? Or sure. would you like to move it forward? Sure, that's fine. 10A. All right, look forward to that. Any other changes? All right, if not, do we have a motion to uh, accept the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, the minutes from March 5th have been provided for, so you've had time to review those. Do we have a motion to accept the minutes? So moved. And a second? Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Consent agenda, uh, items uh, A through N have been provided. And so do we have a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda? So moved. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the amended consent agenda. All right, we'll do that too. Good, good, good catch. Um, do we have a second to that? Second. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Let's see. All right, public comment. Mr. Ronnie Smith. 
You're on. Great. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this meeting. My name is Ronnie Smith. I am very proud to be a citizen of Rowan County. My purpose this evening is very brief, but I am here to fully inform you and share with you some of the most exciting news I've received in a long time. Number one, two weeks ago, after six years of hard work, we received the notice from Washington, D.C. that the final draft proposal was approved to enlarge and enhance the Salisbury National Cemetery Annex here in Rowan County. That is powerful, powerful news, and it will be, I hope, a great, magnificent project for this entire county. I won't go into the details of it. We are in a public comment period, and Washington, D.C. has asked anyone that would like to make a comment to please do so. And you have cards available. I've passed them out. You do not have to be a veteran. I have extra cards if you would like. We would love to get full support of Rowan County in making this project a reality. That is very, very powerful and will be a huge step forward for Rowan County. My second brief item, in the coming weeks, we will be presenting you with the final proposal for the placement of the Rowan County Vietnam Veterans Memorial. We've also been working about six years on this project. We've identified three priority sites and we will be going before the commissioners and the city council for final approval on these sites. We hope and pray we will get your full support. Last but not least, I have another announcement. I am proud to announce today that we're kicking off a special campaign in Salisbury and Rowan County. The name of the campaign is Friends of Bill Standback Campaign for the Shelter Guardian Program. This is the Rowan County Animal Shelter. We have had Nina Dix here before. We are kicking off this campaign this week. We have donors in the community who will match any and all contributions. And our goal is to finalize the campaign so that we can add a full wing to the Rowan County Animal Shelter. Uh, Ms. Dix is being interviewed uh, by the Salisbury Post this week. And we will have, uh, I think, a wonderful article in the paper Please give us your full support. Thank you for your wonderful service to Rowan County. And please, ladies and gentlemen, let's all support these three magnificent projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie. Michael Julian. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Chairman Ed. Um, like to speak a little bit about the West End Plaza here this afternoon. Uh, it's been five years since the county commission, uh, the county purchased the old Salisbury Mall and changed the name to the West End Plaza. Um, the vision at that time of the board was to move our county services to the West End Plaza, uh, such as the health department and social services who are uh, in need of space at the current time. Uh, as of today, the only departments that have been moved to the West End Plaza is the Board of Elections and Veterans Services. Um, since that time, there's been money spent on the West End Plaza to heat and to keep it cool, um, fix a sewer problem at the theater, and to no avail, there's not been any, um, any income from the West End Plaza except for a few of few current stores that are still there. Um, the majority of this board at the time after the was taking place uh, put a stop to the moves to the West End Plaza and um, I'd like to know when the board is going to follow through with the commitments to the citizens who uh, to move these services to the to that facility to the West End Plaza. Um, West End Plaza has needs to be a mixed use facility of private enterprise and governmental agencies and I believe with that done it can be a gem to the county and be a great asset to our county um, so thank you very much thank you mr. Julian all right that's all we have for uh, public comments we'll move on <clears throat> 
Item number three. Um, it's a public hearing for uh, HLC 01-18. Uh, Ms. Karen. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to present the Griffith Sowers House to you tonight. Um, and so I thank you on behalf of the Rowan County Historic Landmark Commission for giving us this opportunity. So this will be brief, but I think you will find it somewhat entertaining. Uh, the Griffiths Sowers House actually started right here, exactly where we're, we are uh, uh, sitting tonight. And you see uh, the picture of the building that we're in, that beautiful government building that uh, was built for us years ago, thanks to Lee Overman. And if you'll look to the right, you'll see that there was a house right behind it. And so the Griffith story starts right here. Uh, James Francis Griffith uh, was a native of Salisbury. He was the only surviving child of Dr. James Francis Griffith, who was a dentist. And he moved to Salisbury in 1872. In 1881, Dr. Griffith built the beautiful Italian house that you saw in the picture on the previous slide. And um, that, of course, is where this uh, Rowan County Commissioner's building is today. Dr. Griffith had a practice here and had uh, his practice in his home. And James Griffith was born to privilege and wealth. That was his son. He was the only surviving child of, the, of Dr. Griffith and his wife. He was very highly educated and uh, has even attended a music school in New York that later became known as Juilliard. Um, uh, James Griffith was a private music teacher uh, for most of his life, but he also taught at the University of Alabama, and he was a supervisor for music for the city schools. He married Great Wa Grace Watson of Greenville, South Carolina in 1925, and the couple moved into the family home here in Salisbury that was behind our building. So as, as uh, you take a look at uh, this beautiful building that we are uh, thankful to Lou Averman for, uh, you can see that um, um, this piece of property brought a lot of money to the Griffith family. Uh, Dr. Griffith died in 1908, and his wife died in 1928. And after she died, uh, shortly after she died, as a matter of fact, James and Grace found an opportunity to sell this piece of property to the United States government. And they sold it for $18,000, which was quite a bit of money at that time. And so after they sold the property, they immediately decided that they were going to build a beautiful country-style home in Rowan County. And you have to sort of think in terms of the Great Gadsby, because the type of house that they chose to build was one that we refer to as a colonial revival country-style home. They purchased land from the Kepley Farm, and they began building their beautiful home out there off of uh, what we now refer to as Highway 70, or extension of Statesville Boulevard. The house was built with entertainment in mind. It, had a, um, it was designed to have a music room with a stage and a very even elaborate dining room that would seat as many as 18 people. They had grand designs on being uh, quite the society members in Rowan County. Unfortunately, and if you think about that time period, we had the stock market crash in 1929. And like many upwardly mobile families, the Griffiths found themselves in financial difficulties. So by 1932, they had already defaulted on their loans. They had pretty much finished the exterior of the house, but the interior of the house still needed a lot of work. Uh, as some things, sometimes things are a little ironic, and um, in 1933, the house actually went up for auction on the courthouse steps. And Jesse Lewis Sowers, who was a bachelor, who happened to also be the superintendent of mails or the postmaster, bought the house for $2,905. And that began a new era for that piece of property, a new generation, a new family. Uh, and they would finish the house and become one of Salisbury's most accomplished families. Jesse was a native of Rowan County, and he resumed the work of finishing the house. And by 1934, the second floor and the west wing were ready, and Jesse, along with his parents and his younger sister, moved into the house. 
But in 1936, Jesse got married, and he and his wife, Ruth, decided that maybe they didn't want to live with their in-laws, or she didn't want to live with the in-laws. Maybe that's what it was. At any rate, the couple moved into a house on Ellis Street, but Jesse continued to do the work on the house in terms of completing the interior. And in 1940, he moved back into the house with his two sons, which we have with us tonight, Charles Lewis Sowers and John Luther Sowers. And they lived in the house um, and grew up in the house. And the final restoration of the interior was done in 1960, between 1960 and 1962. Um, the house continued to be really uh, maintained as a dual household until after uh, Jesse's mother's death. And at that time, it was uh, maintained as a single dwelling. Uh, in 2008, the house, along with 30 acres, were recognized by the National Register of Historic Places as an example of colonial revival country homes and that were popular in the 1920s and 1930s. The house is significant to Rowan County and significantly a landmark for us because it represents one of only two remaining houses of this style. The other house uh, would be Eastover, which is down on uh, 29. At the time that the Griffith Sowers house was constructed, it was the largest house in rural Rowan County, and it was equal in size and ambition to the Hamley Wallace house and also the Walter Franklin McCandless house, both in Salisbury. There you can see a site map and an aerial view of the property. One of the things that's very interesting about this particular style house is that the interest for the house primarily is in the rear rather than the front. Uh, this country style home, the front is usually fairly plain, but as you can see by looking at the garden facade, the, the rear of the house, which is where the family did most of their entertaining and where they spent most of their time is quite elaborate with the columns. There's another view of the house, a close up of the the columns in the back. The Rowan County Historic Landmark Commission completed quite a bit of investigative research on the house, and we firmly believe that the Griffith Sowers House not, not only retains integrity, but also represents a significant example of historic Rowan County architecture, and the commission requests that this house be recognized as a Rowan County Historic Landmark. There are your copies of your ordinances that are in your packet. And now I guess we have our hearing. Thank you. If there are any questions I can answer, I would be glad to answer them. Or try to. You say the sons are here tonight? They are. Mm -hmm. uh, would, would either or both of you like to come up and say anything? I mean, we have that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> What now, saying? I'll tell you what, if Luther is quiet, I'm going to be very surprised. <laughs> come, come on up, Luther. <laughs> yeah, that way we can, we can have a record of it in the microphone. Basically, my title is the live-in caretaker. And uh, if this is approved, then that means I have to dust at least twice a year. Um, <laughs> The, the slides that were projected uh, are actually reversed. And um, one interesting thing is which is the front and which is the back. And in the time when the house was built, if you think to uh, Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, the approach was usually on horseback or by carriages. And horses have a tendency, when they stop at the destination, they relieve themselves, because that's rather hard to do while pulling a load and being in harness. So usually, the occupants of the carriage, their first thing they want to do is get away from the horses and the stinky stuff. And the barn servants would take the horses to a barn or out of the front of the house. And if you look at Mount Vernon, there's no porch roof. It's just steps up to the door. And that's always considered the front, that the staircase always faces the front. 
The back area, where all the fancy columns and the porch usually faced the river, because rivers were very much used for transportation at the time of George Washington, and that was considered the family's private area. It got the breezes off of the river, and occupants that came to visit uh, came by boat and walked up the hill while servants carried their luggage. And up until the date of the movie uh, Gone with the Wind, houses were built in that style. But the designers of the movie didn't think that was very impressive to have just steps up to a door. So they switched everything around to the big columned river facing cool breezes way. And since then, everybody's been building houses completely backwards. <laughs> and uh, so that would be a distinguishing landmark to consider in how architecture has followed. It's evidently a fairly significant point, you know, to consider. And um, years ago, everybody said, why has it no shutters? And my father's answer was, well, since there are 53 windows, if anyone wants to buy the shutters and put them up and keep them painted, they have my permission. <laughs> so that's really a few little tidbits to consider. And I could go on for hours and hours, but I won't. Th thank you, Luther. I was worried how the story started, but you recovered well. <laughs> So thank you for uh, not getting any more descriptive. <laughs> All right, well now it's our duty uh, to conduct a public hearing. And so we will open the floor for a public hearing if there's anyone that would like to say anything uh, about this designation as a historic landmark. All right, we don't have anyone coming forward, so we'll close the public hearing and uh, commissioners will take a motion uh, to support the designation of the Griffith Sowers home exterior as a local historic landmark. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say I had the pleasure of uh, knowing Mr. Lewis Sowers. Uh, when I used to be the manager at Pritchard Paint and Glass, he was adamant about painting that house. And every summer he would come in and we would discuss what we were going to do and we'd get a game plan together. And I was fortunate enough to go to that house a few times and it's absolutely stunning. So I'm glad to see that we can preserve that for future generations and naturally I'm going to vote for this. Very good. Uh, does this mean that, that we get to ride up there and, and uh, view this at any time we want to, Jess? It might be risky. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Someone asked my father how many bathrooms they had. The house had one time he said we have a five seater, so he had a good <laughs> He's not old enough to understand that, Charlie. I'll explain it to him later. He's from the city. You worked on the construction crew. Well, I don't Houston. start again. <laughs> All right, any other comments before we get carried away? All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. We're glad you came today, and uh, congratulations. Uh, thank you for doing what you've done. All right, item number four. Uh, Mr. Muir for um, the 2018 and 19 Home Action Plan. This is the um, public hearing or an opportunity for the public to comment on the county's application for funding in the Cabarrus Iredale Rowan Home Consortium. We anticipate receiving about $147,000 in uh, program funds to do housing, rehabil housing rehabilitation of owner occupied homes. Um, very similar application to what we submitted in the past. One thing I will um, draw your attention to, 
We have benefited in previous program years of having uh, what's termed match. It's 25% of the program costs. Um, we have not had to actually fund that. Um, we've had in-kind or like funds from other sources that we've been able to utilize, but I think um, match is kind of going away at this point um, in terms of non-federal funds that we're receiving, so the county will probably need to budget um, the match in this coming uh, budget year. So as part of the recommendation from staff, after you conduct the public hearing, um, there's a couple things there I just want to make sure that you actually acknowledge um, and do and get entered into the record. So um, the first is to approve the application. The second is to authorize the manager to sign the application. And the third would be to budget those funds in the uh, upcoming budget. And I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have them. Ed, doing my math, you're talking about around $37,000 is the match. That, that's correct. It's, it's somewhere in that neighborhood. 36842. Okay. The, the thing about um, the match is, and, and the funding too, we're in the cycle with the federal government, and they're on a different budgetary schedule than, than our fiscal year. So we're anticipating that amount to be the same amount. It could be less and it could be more. But regardless, um, our, our contribution is going to need to be 25% of whatever we're, we're, um, we receive from Concord or the consortium. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Anything else? Anything else for Ed? Ed, anything else for us? All right, then we'll uh, open the floor to a public hearing. We're required to do this uh, for anyone who would like to speak uh, to the issue of the 2018-19 Home Action Plan. Now would be the time. I want to make a comment. <laughs> you, I forgot, please I state, forgot to please mention state this. your name, sir. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I forgot to mention this. Yeah. The only difference in the, the application that you have and the one that we're going to submit is on page five. Um, we are going to change the Fair Housing Forum with the Salisbury Community Development um, Corporation from April, June to July, September. So we just switched those around, just so you'll know. Um, I failed to mention that. Is there, is there a reason for that? Um, we don't really need one done in this program year, so we're moving it to July. And actually the guy from the Human Relations Council or commission is available during that time frame, so we're just going to move it to that date. It still works in our favor. It's just just want to bring it to your attention. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyone else? All right. If not, we'll close the public hearing, and uh, we have. Uh, we would need a motion to approve the 2018 and 19 Home Action Plan uh, for submittal to the City of Concord and authorize the County Manager to sign the 2018-19 Home Application and then budget the necessary match for home activities in the fiscal year 18-19 Rowan County budget. Do we have a motion? So moved. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. second. All right, motion and a second. Any further discussion? All right, if not, then all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, item 4A, thank you for allowing us to add this to the agenda. This came to our attention uh, last week through, um, I think, the, the CEDC and also um, the Council of Governments on the Opportunity Zone designations. Um, if you look back in the program overview, it says... Uh, H.R. 1, which is the federal budget, was signed into law on December 22nd and it created a new tool for community and economic development designed to provide tax incentives to help unlock new capital sources to fund new investments in underserved low-income communities and I, I would add in their pr uh, private uh, capital sources. And so um, I, I saw this and I spoke with EDC and also with Ed and Ed and I sat down last week 
and uh, basically, and this is available in every state, but in North Carolina, we have 1,000, uh, we have designated 1,000 um, census tracts that are considered low income census tracts in North Carolina. The governor and Department of Commerce are tasked with the responsibility of selecting 251 of those census tracts to go into this federal program called Opportunity Zones. The benefit is if we have census tracts that are selected among those uh, of the 251, then as private investors come in and invest, uh, there may be tax benefits to them that make our projects uh, more competitive than projects that are not in an opportunity zone. So we compared, um, with Ed's help, we compared the projects that we have going on around the county from an economic development standpoint, which would be um, up on exit 81, the Trevi site, along with the Carlton site. That is not in an economic, uh, it is not part of uh, this opportunity, it's not an opportunity zone, probably because there's a billion dollar investment called Duke Energy in the same census tract. So that was one of the only ones that is not an opportunity for us. Uh, in East Spencer, we recently had approved through Duke Site Readiness, uh, the Rusher site. That is in an opportunity zone. Um, in, uh, on Interstate 85, we have the Platinum site. And in the same census zone is the Henderson, are the Henderson Grove, is the Henderson Grove Church Road. Uh, area, which we have uh, a lot of economic development plans in there. Uh, also, you probably heard that uh, China Grove recently had 310 acres right on 85 approved through the Duke Site Readiness Plan. That is part, that, that is in an opportunity zone. Our Granite Industrial Park is in the opportunity zone. Um, and so, um, then also the, the new project for Old Beatty Ford Road is not in an opportunity zone, but it is in what is called a contiguous zone, which it is surrounded by uh, um, census tracts that are in the opportunity zone. So it, it, it by itself is eligible. So um, Ed spent a lot of time over the last uh, probably uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then again today, putting together this packet for us. And so um, bring this before you because if you, we don't have these pages numbered, but page one, two, three is the news flash, four is the map that'll show you uh, the census tracts in Rowan County. So these are not communities that are being put in there. They are not specific projects that are being put in there. They are um, census tracts. So some could have uh, uh, multiple sites. So the following pages, one, two, three, uh, four, five, are the tracks uh, that we were able to pull together um, that uh, we would send to the governor's office and Department of Commerce to ask that they uh, be put in there. And so um, we will work with um, those communities. And, and the reason we're doing this quickly is because it has a filing date. This has to be done by, I think, the 20, 27th. So, yeah, March 27th. So we couldn't go to the next meeting before we did this. So we wanted to bring these to, to you all to get uh, your support for this, um, the, the ones that, you know, they're, they're all important. Uh, and there are other tracks outside of these that we probably could have, uh, for instance, Cleveland is in a contiguous, uh, that, that's right, it wasn't low income, but, and, and again, because Freightliner is right there, uh, but it was in a contiguous um, census track that was eligible. Um, but we, we went to those that we thought had the highest probability and 
and probably the biggest bang for the buck. Um, and, and certainly we thought the uh, Old Beatty Ford Road would, would be one. Uh, the Platinum site in Henderson Grove Church Road, you're picking up hundreds and hundreds, maybe six or 700 acres there. Uh, and that's a big one. And then uh, East Spencer had the Rooster site, China Grove, 310 acres. And uh, I can't, uh, Granite Quarry with uh, the park that we have. So um, if you have any questions for me, again, uh, very appreciative to Ed for the time that he put into this. Uh, he helped put, he pulled all this together that you see before you. And um, appreciate it very much, Ed. Any, uh, any questions? So, again, if, if y'all remember back in the day, Jack Kemp um, had something like this where what we're trying to do is encourage investment in, uh, in low-income communities. And so, um, to, it, to the extreme, what this will do is, let's say someone owns um, property in one of these census tracts that is designated depending on how long they hold that property, when they sell it, capital gains taxes could be lessened based on uh, how long um, the properties have, have been held uh, in this opportunity zone. So if it's 10 years or more, uh, then all of the capital gains, gains taxes could be forgiven. So that could, that could be a huge deal for certainly the private investor but then as those folks are looking at Rowan County, uh, they can calculate that in uh, and, and determine that putting their investment in one of these census tracts could be uh, a, a deal changer for us and them. So that is the purpose of this. All right, any questions? Is that clear? <clears throat> would this, this would cover the land as well as any investment property. On, yeah. built on the land. Yes. So the, ne the next step is Ed is uh, pulling together some, some attachments uh, that will be put with this and then uh, there is a comment section on the website that North Carolina Department of Commerce has provided. And uh, Ed will submit these on behalf of the county along with attachments. And then, uh, you know, at that point, we'll probably work with our elected officials in Raleigh, uh, with um, House Members Warren and Ford and uh, Senator Dan Barrett to see what assistance they can give us to help push these again there's a hundred counties only 251 sites will be approved there's no guarantee that we get any of them um, i certainly don't expect for us to get all of them we may get one we may get three four or five we may get none um, but if you don't have any other questions this is just this is a an, um, this is planning for economic development and give it a nod to those uh, who who need it the most in our community so if not, then uh, I'll make a motion that we uh, endorse this and that we give uh, Ed the, uh, the go-ahead to submit these sites on behalf of Rowan County. Second. Second. <coughs> Any discussion? Any other questions? Again, thank uh, you. Chairman Ed, do you know how long it'll take for us to find out if any or how many of these sites will be approved? Uh, they, they didn't give us a time frame for approving them, uh, but certainly... You know, we, we think one of the big ones is going to be uh, Old Beatty Ford Road. Um, a lot of land there, a lot of opportunity. Um, we will probably put a narrative with it and say, you know, these are the ones that we'd really like to have because they could, they could bring the most uh, opportunity. Um, certainly we're telling them in all of these how much investment has gone on around them. Recently, if you look at China Grove, there's, you know, in Old Beatty Ford Road, it's a couple hundred million dollars in um, 
um, infrastructure that is going on in there. And so it only makes sense that uh, they, they follow that investment. So I, I don't know when they'll be approved, um, but we have to have them in by the 20, 27th. Is the deadline based upon budgetary situations with the state, or is this uh, being handled uh, outside of those parameters? Yeah, it, it has nothing to do with state budget. This is a federal program. Okay, thanks. Um, and they actually, the, the deadline had come and gone, and evidently uh, communities are not applying for these and to that I say good, <laughs> being kind of good for us, is what I'm saying, have less competition. Uh, but another email went out and I, I saw that one and um, went to Ed with it and so this is what we have. Any other questions? All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, thank you for your indulgence. All right, we'll move to uh, item uh, number five with Shane. Quasi-judicial hearing for CUP ON-18. Chairman's speech, I'm required to read. The hearing for consideration of CUP ON-18 is now in session and will focus on an application submitted by Laura Good of, uh, on behalf of Selco Partnership to construct a 165-foot wireless support structure on tax parcel 422-179 located at 280 Rymer Road. If you feel that any member of the board may have a conflict of interest in hearing the case, please address the board now prior to any testimony or information being presented. When the board enters into deliberations to decide the case, no further testimony may be presented. The board will render one of the following three decisions. One, approve the permit as requested or with additional conditions. Two, continue the request. Or three, deny the request. All parties who plan to testify in this case may come forward and be sworn in. Those who testify must state their name and address at the podium for the benefit of the board's clerk. All material presented must be given to the clerk and will become part of the record. This board can only accept sworn testimony. No hearsay ev evidence is admissible. And Mr. Shane Stewart will present the case for the county. Shane Stewart, Rowan County Planning Staff, 402 North Main Street, Salisbury. So the request here on behalf of Selco Partnership, Ms. Laura Good is requesting the conditional use permit here uh, for property at 280 Rymer Road. If you take a look at the vicinity map here, the property here parks in Rymer Road. The transition occurs here to the road name, but this is one continuous road. And um, right at the end of that intersection is property frontage for a 24 acre parcel here outlined in yellow. So the site is just north of 152 and south and west of Town of Faith. So Ms. Good comes into play here to help navigate the applicant Selco partnership uh, to go through this process with the county and then all the other standards to actually have a wireless support structure sited. So the um, applicant here sees a need in this blue search ring. Um, for various reasons, it's identified for their business plans to better serve the customers in that area, um, a tower is needed. So they look with some different folks to determine what is available in that location. There's no tower, there's no alternative structure, um, and staff through GIS verified as such as well. And there's no um, preferred sites either. So you come into play with this parcel here, it meets their criteria. So that's where the application is coming before the board here uh, tonight. So zooming in at this site here, the property owners uh, own 24 acres. It is uh, Debbie Craddock and Patricia Moore is the property owner. So this is from 2017 Pictometry, a property frontage here across the intersection goes into a heavily wooded site, and this is the approximate location of the proposed tower. All right, and zooming in a little bit closer, you see the site here. This would be the nearest resident at 760 feet away. 
and I believe about 150 feet separates us from the nearest property line, 200 from the other. And um, let's look at the site plan. All right, so along that property frontage and then following this direction would be a 30 foot easement serving as their access to the 100 by 100 lease area. Zooming in on the compound site, within that lease area would be the predominant uh, footprint with the tower in the middle and future cabinetries and equipment for the current tenant and future for Verizon. And if you look over here to the right, this is a 165 foot tall proposed tower. It does have a four foot lightning rod at the top and it provides accommodations for four additional carriers in the future. All right, here's a few pictures around the area and with a gated access and a lot of land, there's very few pictures, but for what it's uh, worth in the top left, this is the access from Rhymer Road, a gate here that leads back into the 24 acres. To the right is the Melkin residence at 170 Rhymer Road. That was the closest home that we were looking at in the site plan at 760 feet away. Opposite across the road, this continues um, down parks. And to the left, if you're standing in the road, this is the property owner's land that they also own as well in their home at 725 Parks Road. Okay, the next six slides will have actual photographs of the area with simulations to show you what it would look like when constructed. Now on the top left is also a balloon test that was flown at a balloon in the air at 165 to simulate that appearance as well. So this will be a photograph with that balloon and then this is a photograph with a simulated image of what the tower would look like. In the lower right is an arrow pointing from the picture taken location in the direction it's looking. So this will continue the same throughout the next uh, five additional slides. So from here, you really can't see a whole lot, but right in that small gap there pokes out the top of the tower. At this location here from Castor Road looking back due west, you don't see any sign of the tower. And up here on Mount Hope Church looking due south, you see the tower here. Not visible from this location and a little bit further down, you can see a faint uh, distinction of that tower location. And clearly the best, best visibility will be from Rhymer Road itself. So you see the tower here. Okay, the county's telecommunication tower um, consultant reviewed the application. You have that in your packet as well. And the overall uh, opinion of Cityscape, our consultant, that the tower meets all standards for approval, both local level and everything they've seen in the industry and in reviewing the, the packet of information. And the site is located in area two of the land use plan. There's no specific recommendations for, for towers. Um, I will say you have a whole lot of information attached to the agenda item, but I just tried to give you some information that I felt maybe more visually pleasing and help, helpful to understand the application and not get too technical. So as with any conditional use permit, the three findings of fact, you have some example findings before you as well. And then a fourth motion uh, for considering the request. Here are five potential conditions. I think the applicant is aware of these from about a month ago. They're pretty straightforward, but I would encourage consideration of that as well should the board choose to approve the request. Any questions at this point? Questions for Shane? Shane, is this a, I hate to use the word standard, but you know, there's a lot of these throughout the county. Is this just a typical tower or is there anything exceptional about it? Um, and 
Could you elaborate what you mean? <clears throat> well, like, you know, I live on 601, and we have one that decorated like a Christmas tree, of all things. And uh, I'm saying, you know, is, that's a 165-foot tower, and I've seen them throughout different areas in the county. Uh, so this is just a normal tower. Yes, nothing exceptional about it. Right. Monopole, galvanized, and finished. That one there, for whatever reason, they there, a previous tower was denied there for Shippo. So they come back with a monopine, made it look like a, a giant sequoia out here in Rowan County. So at any rate. We um, never notice it out there either. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, my, my, my concern is that this is not like an exceptionally tall tower versus what the rest of them are throughout the county. It, no, sir. It's actually under the 199, which is right. what we've moved to a couple years ago. Okay. I will mention this Christmas, I did see Commissioner Pierce hanging lights on, on ours. It, it I did had look, your present under look good. it, too. <laughs> All right, any other? The, these will, <laughs> this will be just for cell tower use, won't it? Will they, will they be using all of these, or will they be renting this out to other users? Well, there's four additional opportunities there. Whether or not and when they would ever be used is just... Who knows? But it's at least, it will be designed, and per the, the standard here, three, it's a total of five carriers. So it has, it'll be constructed to withstand and, and, and carry those four additional carriers. But there's others that you have a tower built with one antenna, you may get a second, but it probably be challenging uh, to get all five. But for future generations, you know, it may be, and you know, it's there for it. Anything else? Shane, um, is this a tower that can be used for microwave signal for broadband? That I don't know. All right. Thank you, Shane. Could we say, uh, Donka Shane? Did you get that? <laughs> All right. Uh, is the applicant here? Would the applicant like to speak? Yes, come forward. Uh, state your name. Good evening. My name is Laura Good. I'm with Baker Donaldson, and we represent Verizon Wireless in their application for the proposed telecommunication tower. Um, here also with me this evening is Jack Allen. He is with Juvo Telecom. Um, he worked for Verizon to basically, if you saw that um, map of the search area, uh, his company, he personally went out into that search area to look for co-location opportunities first, um, but then also was the one that found the uh, proposed site and is here to answer any questions you may have about that site selection process. Um, also here is Sam Patel. He is with Verizon Wireless. He is an, uh, an RF engineer and he is here in case you have any technical questions about um, the need for the tower and things of that nature. Um, also here is Michael Berkowitz. He is a certified real estate appraiser. Um, he prepared Exhibit 13 to the application, which was the real estate impact study, and it's here to provide his expert testimony regarding um, impact to adjacent and abutting property values as a result of the proposed tower. At this time, I would like to enter into the record. Um, the application is filed with Exhibits 1 through 16, as well as the revised Exhibit 6, which is the site plan. Um, the revised version was submitted to the Planning Department on February 23rd, pursuant to some um, comments they sent to us, and I believe that was the version that was included in your, your packet, so you do have that updated version. Um, Mr. Stewart has done a great job of, of explaining the basics of the site and the location. Um, to give you a little bit of background on the proposed um, reason for this tower, um, he showed you a picture of the search ring that was included uh, within the application. Um, essentially, this tower is to provide a couple of dual purposes. First is to provide um, capacity offload, uh, but also to fill a significant gap in coverage that exists in the area. Um, I think everyone's pretty familiar with the idea of a coverage gap. That's the whole idea of, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Is there a tower there that will um, provide coverage for area? However, um, in the most recent years, with the um, advent of 
having internet on your cell phone with our smart devices, um, the growing need for towers has come not necessarily from coverage, but from a need for additional capacity. Um, so that means that you may have a cell phone tower servicing an area, but the demand of the customers is exceeding the ability of that individual cell phone site um, to, to meet the demand of the customers. And again, that's mainly coming from our smart devices and streaming of data on our, our devices. Um, so the, the main um, purpose for this tower is to offload an existing granite site um, near the Faith area, um, but also to provide seamless coverage. There are several Verizon sites in the area um, and filling in that coverage so that you have seamless coverage when you transition from tower to tower along the roadways. Um, Mr. Stewart mentioned the search area map. Again, um, the first thing that Verizon uh, does through its consultant um, for site acquisition, uh, they go out into the search area and they first look for available co-location opportunities. So existing towers um, or other tall structures such as a water tower or tall buildings um, or you know, electrical transmission towers that are tall enough and have sufficient elevation. Um, as shown in Exhibit 8, which is the inability to co-locate uh, statement that was provided by Jack Allen, uh, there were no um, existing towers or tall structures within the search area. Uh, therefore, co-location was not feasible and a new tower is required uh, to meet this network objective. Uh, we are proposing a 165-foot monopole tower, so that will not have any guy wires or lattice. Um, it will not be lighted uh, per FAA requirements. It's not required to be lighted. Uh, so it will be pretty much the, most vis the least visually intrusive facility you can have for this type of facility. Um, and it will be designed to accommodate four additional carriers. Um, so if AT&T, T-Mobile, any of those other carriers come into the area, they'll first, if it's in the general vicinity, they'll have to go through what we did, prove an inability to co-locate on our tower before a new tower can be constructed in the area. Um, additionally, this will have um, a fall zone, an engineered fall zone radius of 50 feet, so that in the unlikely event of tower failure, um, the tower would collapse within the 100 by 100 lease area, so the tower would not cross any property lines, any public rights of ways, or any existing buildings. Um, the application is filed with Exhibits 1 through 16. It goes through each of the ordinance standards and shows how we meet each of those standards. Uh, the staff report and the um, consultant cityscape reviewed our application and did state that we meet all of those requirements. Um, so I was going to move to the Board of Commissioners three, requi three required findings of fact unless you have any re uh, questions about the specific tower standards. Okay. Um, the first required finding of fact for the board is that the development of the property uh, is in accordance with the proposed conditions will not materially endanger or endanger the public health or safety. Uh, the facility will be constructed and um, operated in compliance with all applicable FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, FCC, Federal Communication Commission um, requirements as well as state and local uh, requirements as well. Again, it will have a 50-foot engineered fall zone radius, so there will not be any danger to the public from um, the unlikely event of tower failure. And additionally, as mentioned earlier, it will provide the necessary wireless capacity and coverage in the area, which will, will be essential during um, emergency situations for people trying to reach emergency um, 911 on their cell phones. Um, however, increasingly, um, private citizens in their homes are, are moving towards wireless only households. As of the end of 2016, more than half of the country lives in wireless only households. So it's becoming a necessity not only for emergency situations in your car, but also just for your day-to-day -day communication um, from your home. The second finding of fact is that the development of the property uh, in accordance with the proposed conditions will not substantially injure the value of adjoining or abutting property or that the development is a public necessity. Um, again, Exhibit 13 of the application is the real estate impact study that was prepared by Michael Berkowitz, a certified real estate appraiser, and he is here to give his testimony about that report and his ultimate opinion regarding impact to property values. Um, and again, this is a public necessity as it's providing the necessary wireless capacity and coverage in the area. The, fir the third finding of fact is that the location and character of the development in accordance with the proposed conditions will be in general harmony with the area uh, in which it's located and will be in general conformity with the adopted county plans. Uh, 
Uh, the subject property and surrounding properties, as well as the majority of properties in the area, they are all zoned RA, residential agriculture. Towers are permitted as a conditional use so long as we meet all of the requirements of the ordinance. Um, that's prima facie evidence that the use will be in compliance um, or in general harmony with the area. Um, and additionally, the staff report notes that monopole towers less than 199 feet in height are permitted in 98% of the county, further evidencing that it will be in general harmony with the area. Um, a cell phone tower is a pretty innocuous use. This one will not be lighted. Um, it doesn't create any odor, dust, vibration, um, or any loud noises. Um, after the initial construction period, which is roughly 45 days from start to finish, uh, there will not be a noticeable increase in traffic. This will be an unmanned facility. So you're averaging one time a month uh, maintenance by one employee, so there won't be a notice noticeable impact to traffic in the area. This is located towards the rear of an approximately 24 acre property. It's going to have a ton of, there's a lot of vegetation on that property and Verizon is only going to remove that vegetation that's necessary to construct the access road and to um, clear the area for the tower. Everything else will be maintained around the lease area of the tower. Um, again, it's a monopole designed. The balloon test and photo simulations that were that were provided as exhibits um, 14 and 15 of the application show the very limited visibility of the tower from adjacent right of ways. Um, mostly, if it's visible at all, it's going to just be the top portion of the tower. So very minimal visual intrusiveness. Um, then moving to the other evaluation criteria for towers uh, from section 21-59 of the ordinance, uh, whether there's adequate transportation access to the site, um, we will have access to the site via an um, access and utilities easement from the Rymer Road public right of way. Uh, there will be a 20 by 60 parking and turnaround area at the entrance of the facility. Um, and again, that minimal traffic after initial construction because it's unmanned. Uh, second evaluation criteria is that the use will not significantly detract from the character of the surrounding area. Uh, that gets really speaks back to what I covered about the general harmony. It's zoned RA as is all the surrounding properties. Um, it's permitted as a conditional use so long as we meet the requirements that we've shown we have. Um, an innocuous use, setback from the road and a densely wooded um, property. Um, and the balloon test and photo sim showed the, the minimal visual, visual intrusiveness for that. The fourth finding of fact, or fourth consideration is that uh, whether there will be, whether hazardous safety conditions will result. Um, again, there's the 50 foot engineer's fall zone radius to protect adjacent property owners in the un unlikely event of tower failure. Um, there will be a eight foot tall walked fence that will surround the facility with um, three strands of barb barbed wire on top to prevent unauthorized access. Uh, the use will not generate significant noise, odor, glare, or dust, as already uh, mentioned. Excessive traffic or parking problems will not result. Again, that's been addressed. And the use will not create significant visual impacts for adjoining properties or passerby. Again, talking about the siding towards the rear of the property, the existing vegetation that will remain, and pointing to those balloon tests and photo simulations that show the, the minimal vis visual impact from this type of a facility. Uh, at this time, um, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have about the facility. Otherwise, I would respectfully request that the board approve the permit, um, and then would just bring uh, Michael Berkowitz up to provide his expert testimony. Any questions for Ms. Good? Can you answer the question I asked before about microwave and, uh, yeah, okay, our technical guy. <laughs> I, I believe I'm not an engineer, so I'm not qualified to answer that question, but we do have an engineer here who could answer that. If you want to come up, that'd be great. Answer to that is yes. If needed, it could be accommodated to use microwave. Yes, I am Sam Patel. I am the RF engineer for Verizon Wireless. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. You're, you're saying that broadband could be attached to the monopole that you're putting up mm -hmm. and that it could, maybe not this one, and I don't remember off the top of my head if this is a, a dead zone for us, but our, our school system, all the kids have, have laptops, and we have a lot of dead areas in the community. And, I, and that's why I'm sure Judy was asking, uh, uh, Mrs. Kluzman was asking that question that uh, 
we're, we're looking for ways of covering areas that, that we currently uh, have as dead spots. And we wondered if, if it could be attached to other towers that are in existence around the county, as well as the one that you're, and I know you can't answer about the other towers, but if it, you could, uh, if you could have it done to your tower, then maybe it, it would be an answer for us with the others. Yeah, so for, <clears throat> it's a capacity tower, so we will be serving the uh, users within the vicinity of the coverage, but for, you know, in addition to the microwave, if you want to use a tower for microwave purpose, it can serve a purpose to link to the other microwave link as well. So thank you. it can be used. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Good evening, my name is Michael Berkowitz. I'm a certified general appraiser. I have a bachelor's degree in economics from Duke University and I've been an appraiser uh, for 15 years. Uh, I live in Concord, North Carolina. I've lived there for over 20 years. Uh, what I did for this study is I looked at, I visited the site of this proposed tower as well as I searched at towers in the area. They're shared in your report. Some of them did have some limited data in which I was able to extract an opinion, but I also augmented that information with other towers in similar rural areas that are in North Carolina. Uh, and it is my conclusion that this proposed tower as cited will not injure uh, adjacent or abutting properties. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All the information is there, uh, but I do a search ring as well throughout rural areas of Rowan County to try and find as many as I can. Some of those towers are larger. They're 300 feet, not real comparable to a 165 foot pole. It's impossible to make that invisible, but given I've studied thousands of towers where they're poking up the, over a tree line and I've never seen them impact property values, especially in rural areas like this proposed site. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do you, uh, to your point there, do you actually <clears throat> ever find this um, enhances the value of property because it has? A I have seen it's. There's no empirical evidence to support an enhancement to value, uh, but I know of third-party stories where you know a broker may say. I can't get cell coverage in my house, forget it. <laughs> you know, so I think that it's becoming much more of a commodity, just like you expect electrical service or water source or sewer service, you expect cell service at your house. That has not been, there's not enough empirical evidence to support that because when you're in an area with cell coverage versus an area without, well, when I go to the mountains, I purposely pick a place with no cell coverage because I want to be out, <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere. But that, so it's really kind of hard to gauge what is truly influencing those property values. Is it the rural location or is it the cell coverage? So it's kind of a, becomes a mix. But I think it would definitely be something that would enhance development as far as understanding that those services are there, just like when you bring water or sewer or some of those services, a better road, those types of infrastructure. Any other questions? I had a couple questions. I don't know who, to an who would answer it, but <clears throat> so the, the property is going to be owned by Verizon. Is that am I correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Verizon will be leasing a 100 by 100 square foot lease area. Okay. Uh, so it'll be a 10,000 square foot lease area, um, but the property will still be owned by um, Debbie and Patricia Craddock, or Debbie Craddock and Patricia Moore. All right. And um, I know there was talk of uh, this is to help with capacity issues. <clears throat> so across the whole network in the county, I guess, would affect other areas. You'd have more if, if the uh, capacity is... There's more capacity in that area. Does it help other sections of the county also, or is it just for this one area? So briefly, I'm going to answer that, and then I'm going to let my RF engineer come back up here. Um, generally, there are other towers in the area that this will provide capacity offload. So yes, it will help other um, areas. Now, not it's not going to be as broad as countywide, but in the general vicinity. And I'll I'll let um, Sam come up and speak more detailed about that. So the objective started to offload the granite site, which is our existing site, and then the locations we picked is the central locations, which covers our adjacent site. So there are actually additionally three sites and four sites we're going to be offloading 
so not in addition to the granite site. So, so that's actually interesting this came up because I was uh, um, at a business off of uh, Bringles Ferry Road and they were complaining about not having Verizon signal <clears throat> and I had a Verizon phone, I didn't have signal either. So this won't provide any new coverage for extended areas other than the area that it's in? Uh, it will, <clears throat> there is a coverage, but there is, uh, it will cover, um, uh, fill some coverage gaps, you know, for there is a northwest for the faith the town is, so it will cover, it will bridge the gap, the coverage gap, a certain part. But uh, we'll have to look at it, what specific area we're having a uh, coverage issue in order for me to kind of give you a better answer. So basically the faith area, but it faith. would probably go as far up as... Yeah, so it will, it will, for faith town, it will offload capacity. And for somewhere, if it's, it will also help some spotty coverage, which is missing right now. So we need to get them a list, list of dead areas and get, yeah, them, yeah, we'll get, <laughs> get them start throwing towers up is what you're saying? Right, yeah. Yeah. Well, the lake, lake is a challenge. Yeah. Ringo Ferry Road's a challenge. It's terrible. I do have a map, um, if you're interested in seeing it, that basically shows the adjacent sites that, so you can see the general area um, that this is looking to serve in terms of providing the capacity offload and filling in the gap in service. Yeah, that'd be great. I will note that the pins are a bit hard to see because they're green and they blend in with the Google Earth background of green, but each pin you see, it basically is a it forms a semicircle to the north around the proposed tower location, and those are all the sites that will um, obtain in increased capacity offload. Um, and it, you'll see visually how, since this is kind of in the middle of the semicircle, it'll fill in the coverage uh, between those towers as well. Just note to whoever makes this map, do you know that I read one time over 50% of American men are red-green deficient? <laughs> So throw, throwing green pins on here is driving half of us crazy. Um, oh, there's one. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I am green right. proficient. I'll be glad to talk with you about that. Thank you very sure. much. It's, it's my excuse when I run a red light as I... <laughs> You'll um, talk to the sheriff about that. Perhaps you could jot down in your uh, notes as you leave to take a look at Bringle Ferry Road would be a... Ferry Road, okay, sure. Uh, there's other spots that I don't know about, but that's, I think, generally recognized as poor coverage out there. So right. this is basically going to cover all the way to 85? There's three of them along 85, yeah. and then these three back here from 52. This is Highway 52 here, and then these three, map, these three up here are on the other side of 85. What's that? All right, well, any other questions for the engineer? All right, thank you, Mr. Patel. All right, thank you. All right, In, anything else for us is good? Not unless you have any other questions. Other questions for her? Mike, anything? Craig? Good, all right. Judy, Jim? All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll, uh, we'll conduct a, a public hearing now and open the floor up. If there's anyone that would like to speak, uh, but before before I do that, um, Shane, can I can I ask you one question? Uh, so notification mailings, could you go through that with us? And so everybody would be notified within a hundred feet. And I thought about putting that slide together, but my goodness, time kind of got away. 
But if you'd like a list of who received notice, I can do that. No, just that you all did it, and did you did you receive any? Received one call today. It was a property owner that owned adjacent land. It was for her mom, and she thought, are they coming through my property? And we said, well, absolutely not. So they're just kind of curious, but she was fine with it. Okay. So outside of that, no real complaints. And a sign posted at the site as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we'll open the floor for a, if there's anyone that would like to come and speak uh, either for or against this project, this would be a good time to do it. Was she sworn in? All right, we'll need to have you come forward and be sworn in. Thank you. If you'll give us your name. My name is, <clears throat> excuse me, Emily Snyder, and my land butts up next to this, and I have 20 acres. My house is like on five and the rest of it's open land mm -hmm. and I just really don't want to look out my door and see a cell tower because <clears throat> the land it has animals on it all I see is deer and trees and I don't really want to see a cell tower out in the woods so and I I really don't know um, Tiger World they have a cell tower Binder Mountain in faith has a cell tower also but at the same i don't know what else to say i just don't want to see a cell tower at the end of my property i understand thank you thank you all right, all right anyone else all right if not we'll close the public hearing and uh, mr chairman if yes. i may yes sir the applicant has uh, proposed findings of fact uh, that she read aloud, but it's on pages 10 to 12 yes. uh, in your application. And from my notes, uh, as she was going through them, that they, they're, they include the proposed staff findings. Uh, there are two or three more that appear consistent with the testimony that was presented. If you'd like to make your motions based off of that, I think it would be fine. Are you recommending that we use those rather than what staff gave us? I think that would be the preference. Okay. And it's just as to the three primary motions. Your, your fourth motion will be uh, to approve or deny. Yes. And, and, but as to the three primary motions, you can use those. All right, so uh, if you, or, or you want me to, you don't have those, do you? All right, well then I'll read um, the three items. <laughs> Seriously? I think he's talking about this right here. Well, yeah, but they, they had one in the application that, that's as to the three motions, I, I think they covered some, some additional facts, but as to those three primary motions, there were, Four facts for motion one, there were two for motion two, and five for motion three. This is right here. So you're saying our motion What they submitted, yeah. Our motion is just that we find their evidence as motion. No, you'll still go through your three motions. So staff handed out proposed findings. Mm -hmm. The applicant also submitted proposed findings in their application. And they've asked if we would consider those as the findings. Well, I am on page 10 and I see um, item E, required findings. Yes. Yes. And so there's uh, one with a bullet below that. Right. There's two with a bullet that carries over to midway page 11. There's uh, three that goes uh, half half of page 11, all of page 12, and uh, 
you, you're, 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 it's certainly in your discretion to use staff's version if you okay. think in, 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 in brevity it would be helpful. All right. We're going to use staff. <laughs> makes, it, makes it easier for us. Good. All right. Then uh, I'll offer up this uh, as motion uh, number one, the development of the property in accordance with the proposed conditions will not materially endanger the public health or safety fact. One, based on plans submitted and established conditions of approval, the proposed tower will not will comply with all applicable federal, state, and local regulations. Fact two, in the unlikely event of tower failure, the structure will be certified by a North Carolina professional engineer to fall within the lease area prior to the issuance of a zoning permit. Third fact is that the proposed tower will provide the means for Verizon Wireless to address documented coverage and capacity deficiencies and co-location opportunities for future telecommunication providers and industry recognized as a public necessity. I make that in the form of a motion. Second. I right, have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Fact two, that the development of the property, I make this in the form of a motion, that the development of the property in accordance with the proposed conditions will not substantially injure the value of adjoining or abutting property or that the development of is a public necessity. Second. Fact that Oops. certified general appraiser Michael Berkowitz provided testimony summarizing statements from his impact study, which concluded the proposed tower will not substantially injure the values of adjacent properties and that it is located in an area where it does not substantially detract from the aesthetics and neighborhood character. I'll make second. that all right in a second. All in favor say aye. 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 And third, that the location and character of the development in, in, in accordance with the proposed conditions will be in general harmony with the area in which it is located and in general conformity with any adopted county plans. Fact one is evidence from the balloon test and photo simulations. The proposed tower would only be visible along portions of Rymer Road and two small sections along Mount Hope Church Road. Fact two, according to the staff report, Monopole towers less than 199 feet in height are permitted in 98% of the county zoning jurisdiction subject to a conditional use permit, a pro process that assumes the use is generally compatible with surrounding properties. Fact three, wireless towers do not generate significant levels of noise, odor, glare, or dust. And fact four, this request complies with all specific conditional use requirements in section 21-63 of the zoning ordinance and make that in the form of a motion. Second. second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. And then uh, we have five, con uh, so, so then I would make a motion to approve CUP 01-18 with, if you turn to page four, uh, with uh, the following five conditions subject to compliance with all plans and supporting document packages received from Baker Donaldson et al dated January 9, 2018 and revised site plans dated uh, February 19, 2018. In fact, I'll just offer what is provided here and won't read through all of them, but I'll, uh, I'll make a motion to approve CUP 01-18 with those five conditions. Second. All right. Thank you. Any discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Good luck to you. Bringle Ferry Road. <laughs> Anyone else in the audience have another one you want them to look at while they're here? <laughs> Now's the time. They're all shaking their head. Mayor, grab her <laughs> on the way out. And that, I mean that figuratively, of course. You back? Again. All right, we've got another quasi-judicial hearing, and I've got to read you this again. Uh, the hearing for consideration of CUP 0318 is now in session and will focus on an application submitted by Charles Lewandowski to accommodate the wholesale trade of, uh, trade of used motor vehicle parts on tax parcel 239-031 located at 208 Performance Road. 
If you feel that any member of the board may have a conflict of interest in hearing the case, please address the board now prior to any testimony or information being presented. When the board enters into deliberations to decide this case, no further testimony may be presented. The board will render one of the following three decisions. One, approve the permit as requested or with additional conditions. They'll continue the request or deny the request. All parties who plan to testify in this case may come forward and be sworn in. Those who testify must state their name and address at the podium for the benefit of the board's clerk. All material presented must be given to the clerk and will become part of the record. This board can only accept sworn testimony. No hearsay evidence is admissible. And again, Mr. Stewart will present the case for the county. Shane Stewart, Rowan County Planning Office, 402 North Main Street, Salisbury. So Mr. Lewandowski purchased a lot in the um, Morrisville Motorsports Center. And for those not familiar with that portion of the county, it's off Highway 152, south off Wilkinson Road, here on Performance uh, Road, right at the county line. So here's a close-up picture of Lot 7. And I think there's only a handful of lots left that have not been built on in Mooresville Motorsports. But um, so Mr. Lewandowski recently purchased the lot for a race shop and also wanted to have the wholesale trade of new parts. Both of those are permitted by right in the industrial district. And unfortunately, when you consider the SIC code or NAICS code that our ordinance is based on, it lumps salvage yards into the same classification as any other um, wholesaler of used parts. He is not a salvage yard, doesn't propose one, but this board would have to be involved with any siting of that uh, proposed use. So his operations also don't include any teardown of vehicles. They're pre they come prepackaged parts, so you may not know the difference between new and used. Also, it's wholesale trade. It's not folks coming like they're going to Napa. So it will all be strictly business to business or the racing community folks. You know, that's not your everyday customer. All right, let's look at the site plan. I will say this is a bit of a modification from the one in your packet. It, it seems that the septic needs are going to be in the front rather than the back. So it shifted the building back slightly. And um, I think there's about the same amount of gravel, but it's not quite as wide. It's just extends a little bit further into the site. That's the predominant difference between what's in your packet. And again, for those aren't as familiar with this part of the county, I think it's interesting that we have, uh, in the late 80s, this park developed. And it totals 105 acres, 66 industrial lots. And the CBI that surrounds it, that also includes the Mooresville drag strip, that totals 230 acres. You go further up, this map wasn't updated, but this board um, earlier this month or last month approved the rezoning here. This totals another 100 acres industrial, um, probably about 30 businesses there. So clearly a business area and what he's proposing probably is pretty close to what you'd find in the park. Definitely the race shops, but maybe even wholesale trade of parts as well. All right, so the first and top left, the picture looks into the site from the road to across the street at your back at 209 Performance Road and then these two flanking left and right. Um, so I think based on the use it fit nicely in the property. The other thing if you consider the land use plan the purple area of the map it's in a commerce slash industrial area that provides specific use recommendations but recognizes the need and the future need uh, for industrial in that area. So findings of fact, I do have an example going around and this one as well, I didn't uh, touch on it, but it needs an SNI permit for the 1070 option to exceed 12% impervious coverage. The board's approved probably 60 plus in that area. Anything with the build in that picture receive one with few exceptions. So the motion should include the conditional use permit and the SNI permit. Any questions? So we're basically here 
because of the SIC code? Well, it's, it's almost impossible. There may be a way that we could craft the ordinance to say you could have salvage operations inside a building. Well, prepackaged pre -packaged items that he's selling would seem to me to be simple enough to, to distinguish that in a salvage yard. And we wouldn't have to waste his time or your time uh, with that. I mean, it is unfortunate, but regardless of how it comes in, it's still a wholesale of a used part. There's no other option it provided. In the future, maybe we could look at, the, the only distinction I've noticed in other jurisdictions is if the operation is in, contained within a building um, and then you're still dealing with the same, this is just his is a clean version of what others may do. Um, there may be a way to craft it, but I don't know that if a large building came in that it, it wouldn't be the same, it's just you don't see it. All right, any other questions for Shane? All right, if not, would the applicant, uh, you have anything to say? Uh, <clears throat> um, I, I don't think so. I, I think Shane touched everything. These parts are specialized um, specific to motorsports, so no street car, you know, uh, no tear down. Um, the biggest thing is, I, Shane explained it to me, you know, very um, specifically on why, you know, what a, why it's a salvage yard on paper, you know, but um, because of these parts, it's it's a pretty straightforward process. They come prepackaged or, or tagged, and get put on the shelf and, and to, to be resold. Um, again, there's no teardown. It's actually a cleaner process than any race team. But if you went to any race team or race shop in a county, you would, you would see the same exact parts. It just, it's cleaner because they're not being used. So. Are, are you in business now? Yes. Uh, where is that business? It's a home-based business in, in Mooresville. And um, okay. so, so we, like I said, things are going well. So we, we want to step up and um, we have a lot of friends in that area. Um, you know, that's uh, the biggest thing is that that industrial park is still, you know, uh, majority race race related businesses where um, in Iredell, the Talbert Point Industrial Park and Lakeside Park off uh, exit 36 has slowly transitioned from motorsports to other industries so that that's what makes it so appealing to us to be, you know. Could, could you give us, I don't know, off the top of your head, just some of the items that, sure. that it is um, you sell? Um, let's see, um, springs, which are, uh, you know, the front springs are about uh, six inches by, I'm sure you can picture them, but, you know, six inch by nine inch. And then the rear springs are about the same diameter, but, you know, a little bit taller. Um, spindles. Um, gauges and, and ignition boxes, um, very small parts. We're not, um, we're, we don't do really anything motor related or drivetrain related. So the, you know, it's a very clean process and, and uh, doesn't really involve much um, when it comes to um, anything that would you know, harm the, the property or, or anyone around us. So the majority of what you sell can be UPS is what you're saying. Absolutely. Okay. Actually, so that everything. means it's small, compact parts. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'm familiar with what you're talking about. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that that you're Appreciate not that. stripping down a car and trying to sell yeah, I, and doors. Yeah. And and I, I you know I really I honestly <clears throat> respect being here and appreciate taking time because I really don't want my neighbor having two wrecked Honda Civics out there and pulling parts off it and keeping it out there and you know what I mean in that park and. They, they created an association in the, in the industrial park recently, well, I, a year or two ago, and they're, you know, uh, I've worked with them to make sure, but it's, you know, all oh, those guys are racing people, so they know exactly what I have and, or what I, what I would have in, in the building. So, obviously, we want to, we want to grow, and, um, you know, it needs to be, our, our, our customers are, you know, companies that spend millions of dollars a year racing. I really got to keep that piece of property up for I can keep their business, you know. 
do you market the majority of your product on like websites or these type of things or um not as much as you would think you know like i said our, our customer base is really nascar related so those guys are again they spend so much money they have such good quality people that they the knowledge is incredible so you know they a lot of the guys that order order pieces from me are you know the same people that i call for advice on on what direction i need to go in or or what i need to have in inventory and stuff like that so they're you know well when you uh bust out of this building i want you to make sure to stay in rowan county okay i think i can do that all right i think i can do that appreciate that Yes, Thank thanks you. for thanks for moving here. Yeah, we yeah. appreciate you. Like I said, trying to be here for a long time and that's that industrial park really is, you know, it's 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 the strongest, I would say, across all three or four counties in the area when it comes to racing related, you know. So it's it's a no brainer to be there and and uh it's you know, it's where we want to be for a long time. Good, Good luck. Will. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, and uh, we wish wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you again for the time. Yeah, if uh, if you want us to do a ribbon cutting or something for you, if that's appropriate. Do you have those? Do you have the golden shovels? We do. Okay. Yeah, we, we find Maybe some. we can do one of each. You know. We'll borrow some from Mooresville. They, okay. They have the golden shovels. <laughs> yeah. Ours are working shovels. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'm on the right side of it then. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for the time. Any other questions for him? All right. Thanks. All right, uh, we'll conduct another public hearing, and if anyone has uh, anything they'd like to add uh, for or against, all right, no, then we'll close that, and uh, we'll approach the uh, findings of fact. There's three of them. Uh, Commissioner Klusman, if you'd provide those for us, we'll vote on them individually. Actually, I just have one question before we do that. Um, the potential conditions. We'll, we'll do that um, during uh, the the final approval of the. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I move the <clears throat> following findings. Number one, the development of the property in accordance with the proposed conditions will not materially endanger the public health or safety. Fact, the proposed use as a race shop and wholesale trade operation is similar to other lots within the Mooresville Motorsports Center. Fact, established conditions of approval ensure motor vehicle parts and junk motor vehicles could not be kept outside the proposed building. All right, that's a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Number two that the development of the property in accordance with the proposed conditions will not su substantially injure the value of adjoining or abutting property or that the development is a public necessity. And fact, no material evidence was presented suggesting this request would injure property values. All right, that's a motion. We have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Number three, I move that the location and character of the development in accordance with the proposed conditions will be in general harmony with the area in which it is located and in general conformity with any adopted county plans. Fact, Mooresville Motorsports Center totals 105 acres of industrial zoned property comprised of 66 lots surrounded by 232 acres of CBI zoned property, which includes the Mooresville drag strip. Fact, the land use plan for areas west of I-85 identifies this property within a commerce slash industrial area, recognizing the multiple industrial uses south of Highway 152. We have a second. Second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Then do we have a motion uh, to approve with these uh, conditions all motor vehicle parts must be kept within the building and no junk motor vehicles may be kept outside the proposed building uh, in a, um, those are conditions of approval of CUP 03-18 and SNIA 02-18. So moved. Second. All right. Any other discussion? Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you and good luck to you. Yeah. Item number seven, Mr. Kress. Thank you, Shane. Thank you.
Welcome back. Good evening. How are you? Good. All right. Um, basically, I have an update for the broadband task force. From the past item, I was to basically get a group of folks together that would be willing to serve on the task force. Uh, I've communicated with several members and do have um, a listing of task force members. The only thing I do have, you know, if the board would like to pursue this is to have a commissioner be on the task force. I see one. So I think we have everyone that we need for the task force. Um, so with that, I provided the information for our members, um, including myself, Chris Solis, the emergency services director, Candace Solomon Hosey with the Rowan Salisbury School System, Amy Lynn Albertson with the Rowan County Cooperative Extension, Lee Simmons, a representative for the southeastern portion and citizen serving that area, and Bevan Fink from the Cleveland area. So with that, if I can have the board's approval on the list. How did you, how did you come about uh, the citizen names? I actually had a couple recommendations for that uh, as I was going through, and so I had reached out, and one actually had contacted me as well. So, um, so I think we'll have good participation. Good. All right, so we have these nominations in front of us. Um, do we have a motion to accept these people? Second. All right. Do we have any questions or? Yeah, my only question, Mr. Chairman, is is there a termination date on this task force? I have been asked that. Um, I mean, it's kind of open-ended. Uh, generally, a task force is tasked with mm -hmm. with something for a limited time so that they have a you know parameters to work within. And I I, I think we ought to set some type of termination on this. Uh, how about how about twelve months? I think that'll be sufficient. Think, think that'll give us sufficient time. Oh, yes, we can always look for extension if need be. All right. So. Um, so do we have a motion then to approve these task force members uh, uh, for a term of 12 months so for, the, for the task force? Second. Okay. Any other uh, issues, concerns, questions? Uh, folks that I've talked to about uh, the progress of this task force um, are very interested in, in the western end of the county. Yeah. So if you decide to expand your folks there, and probably every other area that is lacking in coverage, you could probably find some more folks. So uh, don't think, I mean, I'm, I was surprised at the number of folks that were very interested in this task force. So you can get many more folks if you need it. That's great. I will say these will be open meetings, so we'll definitely be able to have participation okay. as well. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, Randy, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Appreciate what you're doing. Sure. Mr. Meacham, welcome. Good to, good to have you back. Sorry to, it's a long one. Patience is a virtue. Yes, it is. Board of Commissioners, County staff, appreciate the opportunity to present a project to you that has been uh, supported and adopted by the Tourism Development Authority. Just a quick overview uh, for anyone that is uh, general information. The Rowan County Tourism Authority is a public authority, meaning we are established independent by the North Carolina General Assembly. Uh, we're charged with various things ranging from visitor marketing, branding, events, activities, and tourism-related capital projects, which is what we'll discuss tonight. As a reminder, we're funded through a 6% occupancy tax. We do not receive local government funding per se. This tax is collected at lodging properties, remitted to the county, who then remits the funds on a monthly basis to the tourism authority. Um, two thirds of the funds each year, at a minimum, should be spent on marketing the associated cost. Up to one third of the annual occupancy tax can be sp spent on tourism related expenditures. Just looking over the last fiscal year since 2013, as we'll be coming forward with this request tonight, I thought it was important that we just demonstrate the financial capacity of the Tourism Authority related to this project, marketing, and others. Um, fiscal year to date, we're up about 17.7% from the previous year. We had budgeted a 14% increase, so we're almost 4% ahead of budget projections. Roughly, this is looking at a 47% increase in tax revenues to the Tourism Authority since fiscal year 2013. 
Um, quick overview of tourism related capital projects. They're investments that the North Carolina General Assembly gives tourism authorities the ability to make. Um, they are specifically to support increased economic activity through visitor expenditures, infrastructure, services, and business development. Um, just to read from the General Assembly, tourism related expenditures that are in the judgment of the Tourism Development Authority are designed to increase the use of lodging facilities, meeting facilities, convention facilities in the county, or to attract tourists or business travelers to the county to provide additional visitor services and infrastructure. That is from the North Carolina legislation that founded the Rowan County Tourism Authority. Um, we did go through a tax change in 2017. That tax structure eliminated the Salisbury TDA, consolidated everything under a county TDA with a singular tax rate across the county. It also did allow us to begin expending tourism-related capital funds within the county. Originally, we were limited to the city of Salisbury. Some of the previous investments for visitor services you may be familiar with, the trolley system, Lee Street Theater was an example of attraction we supported, and some of the infrastructure, wayfinding, public art, Christmas decorations, and streetscapes. So today we're here to talk about what we call the Railwalk Tourism and Economic Development Project. It's a two-phase project. Phase one, which we'll discuss tonight, regards repurposing a 1925 Fisher Thompson building into a multifaceted visitor infrastructure. Phase two, which I'll show you to give you some general context of the area, is a streetscape project. The Tourism Authority feels that this does support increased business activity, economic development. It does expand our capacity substantially for tourism events, activities, markets, drive visitation, and also does expand our visitor infrastructure in the Railwalk District. So where are we talking about? We're talking about uh, North Lee Street and Depot Street. You can be looking within the center of this. Uh, you may see some familiar structures, the Amtrak station, the train station. At the bottom of the screen, top right corner, is the end of the Railwalk District, Morgan Ridge Railwalk Brewery and Eatery. If you look west, you'll see where Lee Street Theater is heading up towards the top of the screen. Other familiar places, the police station, uh, existing in, uh, assets in the area, such as the trolley bar and other meeting facilities. But this general district is an area that first became under um, engagement in 2002 between the city of Salisbury, downtown Salisbury Incorporated, and one of the major property owners in the area, Ro uh, Rowan Investments, uh, one of the principals with Rowan Investments, Mr. Kettner. I just want to thank him for being here this evening. Uh, began looking at how do we create a destinational experience within this area. That led to a series of private investments, which really started culminating in the last couple of years with Lee Street Theater. Uh, other investments in the area have been the Emporium in terms of retail, Railwalk. We've also got expanding train station in the area. And most recently, the Morgan Ridge Railwalk Brewery and Eatery is one of the latest investments in this area. Uh, quick, we're going to do an overview of the streetscape. So this is actually if you're looking down into the Railwalk. So the bottom of the screen would be Depot Street. The top of the screen would be Lee Street. So what we're proposing in phase two of this project is in partnership with the city of Salisbury, we'll work to develop an entirely new streetscape which connects the train station to the Railwalk District, tying into the original rail line, making a very uh, popular, what we'll consider pedestrian area access. So this is if you're coming in on Depot Street, proceeding down the current Railwalk to your left would be uh, the, the motor shop to the, in front of you would be where the old Integro offices used to be and then to your right is additional retail. So if you're coming through the, through the rail walk, this would be some of the things we're adding, looking back towards Depot Street, stage seating, pavilion area, I mean, access for concerts, music. Then you'll start to turn down the rail walk. We've already started the banner program in this district. This is moving down the rail walk towards uh, uh, Car Street. This is, also, this is cutting between the buildings. Some of you may be familiar with this area. If you were at Lee Street Theater and you kind of look what would be an alleyway now, this would be a changing the whole walkway, tapping into the original brick. Moving into the center of the rail walk, we're actually going to add a third entrance to the rail walk in long term. That's for safety, security, and also to create a focal point. Um, to your left would be the uh, auto parts store. To your right would be some of Chris Bradshaw's uh, retail spaces. So this would be a new access point to the rail walk. Coming down through the rail walk, heading towards Car Street. Heading towards Car Street, this would be Lee Street Theater currently to your left. This would be on Car Street looking back towards Lee Street Theater. Now this leads us to the project we're here to talk about today. So from this future view, you turn around and you see this. This is a 1925 Fisher Thompson structure 
was purchased by the Rowan by the Convention and Visitor Bureau technically and transferred to the Tourism Authority in early 2017. This is the current structure looking from Lee Street Theater. So you currently own the building? Correct. Yes. You want to buy it? No. <laughs> this is looking down the rail walk. You can see uh, Morgan Ridge Rail Rock Brewery in the back. This is from the back side of the building and from the front again. And what the proposal is, the Tourism Authority has begun to create, will make it look like this. This will be a new dynamic event space pavilion that uh, has already begun the process for approval. Uh, this does preserve the facade. This does serve as dynamic event space for markets, outdoor concerts, activities. When it's not in use, it'll increase access to the area, both pedestrian and vehicular. It creates a level surface between the current rail walk and the facility. It's an aerial view. You see the Emporium to the right. You can see Railwalk Artist Galleries to the left. If you look further back, you can see where the brewery is. This will be another aerial view. Looking at the front. This would be if it was closed off for a farmer's market. Looking up Car Street. Are the telephone poles going underground? Uh, currently, that is not in the initial planning due to the cost and... Could you go back one slide? Yes, can. This is just when we were doing it in design. It will include an entirely new lighting package, bents, benches, structure. This will be from the back of the rail walk. This will be looking down towards uh, Car Street and the theater in the back side of the pavilion. You can see how it will open up into the uh, general parking areas so we'll be able to do large concerts, activities, events. Just another example. Coming into the structure. An overview. All right, so what brings us here today? The Tourism Development Authority Board uh, began the process of developing uh, what we consider this railwalk two-phase process uh, for the purposes of increased tourism activity and economic development. As I mentioned earlier, we purchased the property in 2017. Uh, it is now owned by the Tourism Authority, so it, will, it is a publicly owned property. Fully redeveloped, it will be accessible by the public. This project meets what we consider the criteria for the tourism capital funds. At a recent board meeting, the Tourism Development Authority did approve this project completely and approved approaching the Board of Commissioners for an interlocal agreement. As we proceed forward, I think it's just important for the record that Commissioner Pierce, who serves on our board, did recuse himself from this process, knowing that it could be coming forth to the Board of Commission. Has this been approved? Yes, this has been a fully approved project. Uh, it has been about nine months to get it approved. We had two separate hearings with Historic Preservation Commission. The first hearing for approval was in a unanimous vote in favor. The second was six to one. The plans that you saw have been approved by the Preservation Commission, which is important because this is a historic structure and any alterations to the structure or changes do require their approval. It is in a uh, federal historic district and it is considered a contributing structure. What we are doing is preserving the facade with a slight alteration and expanding it but taking out the back and completely rebuilding it. Structural engineers did determine that the rear portion of the building is not sound and is not safe for any use really moving forward at all. Um, these plans have been submitted by, to the Rowan County Building Inspection. Our local architect for the project is Ramsey Bergen Smith. The plans have been approved by County Building Inspection and can proceed with construction. Since the Tourism Development Authority is a public authority, we do go through the standard bid process for anything uh, in excess of a certain dollar amount that's exceeded that dollar amount. We will be opening bids March 20th, uh, 2019, which is tomorrow, at our office at 10 a.m. Streetscape is being submitted to Historic Preservation for consideration at their next meeting, and then from there, phase two will proceed with consideration of a partnership between us and the city of Salisbury. Upon implementation, this is key for us, of the new tax law um, the former TDA and the city leadership at the time wanted to make sure that projects that were started under the what we called Convention and Visitor Bureau between the Salisbury TDA and Rowan TDA, that those commitments were honored. Um, this is now a county TDA, but the board today felt as they did then that anything we started, we should fulfill those commitments, we should stick true to the word that we've said, and we want to 
proceed with that. Part of coming to you tonight for an interlocal agreement is so that we can really expedite this project to move on to other large-scale projects across all of Rowan County. Um, we're focused on that, trying to grow the economic activity, supporting our tourism-related businesses, but we do realize that we have spent, because of our structure, a lot of time in the central business district of Salisbury, and that we're looking forward to moving forward with future projects. So what is the request tonight to the Board of Commission? Uh, we're asking that the Board of Commissioners consider entering into an interlocal agreement with the Tourism Development Authority for the completion of the Railwalk Pavilion. Uh, as just point of information, we had a very productive meeting with your staff, County Manager and County Finance Director, to simply go over the mechanics of this process. Um, this is a process utilized across North Carolina between multiple government agencies. Some of your larger projects that you could think of would be a convention center, large parks, sporting complexes where the tourism authority will utilize occupancy tax funds to reimburse or support a larger scale county project over a multi-year period. Uh, that's how many of your tourism related projects across North Carolina are funded or specifically in sports, recreation and leisure. Um, what we're proposing and seeking your consideration for is that the tourism authority would um, agree to reimburse the county over a five-year period beginning in fiscal year 2018-19, which effectively starts July 1 and ending in 2022-2023. This would involve the county remitting the cost of the project to the TDA this fiscal year, and then we begin a five-year repayment process to the county. When you say this fiscal year? Fiscal 17-18, correct. We were wanting to proceed uh, within the spring, if at all possible. What was sent in an email I, when I did the, the calculations wrong was when I typed in the, the dates wrong. We're, we'd like to proceed this fiscal year, if possible, um, just because we want to get this project moving and expedite it forward. Um, I kind of want to go over, just so you understand the mechanics from the Tourism Development Authority in terms of the capital budget and the ability to repay this project. Um, currently, for fiscal year 17-18, the Tourism Authority has $100,000 committed to its capital project. There are two existing projects that we have remaining those commitments, public art, wayfinding, and we are currently using a similar program that we did with the city of Salisbury for the trolley program. The city purchased the trolleys up front. The TDA entered into a refunding agreement with the city. That program rotates off next fiscal year, which is 18-19. You can see the trolley payment schedule there. So we left Railwalk blank in 17-18, which would give a total of 92,000 and a balance of 8,000. Due to the increase in tax revenues, the increase of a new hotel, which is opening at the beginning of 2019, we're going to expect a jump to 100 to 150,000 in our capital budget, which will then go up $10,000 a year subsequently through 2023-24. If the project was as we expected, $300,000, and you began a $60,000 a year uh, repayment, um, it would go from 60,000 a year, you can see the total each year. And so this is designed to demonstrate the capacity of the TDA to reimburse the county. If the project came in substantially higher, up to say 450,000, the TDA would be able to go up to a $90,000 a year repayment starting in fiscal 1819, which would still leave leftover space within the budget each year. So this was in order to demonstrate with the growth in occupancy tax revenue, both from the previous slides showing the tax revenues each year, the open capacity in the capital budget, which by the end expedition of this project, we're anticipating around $200,000 available for future capital projects. Those are projects that as time develops, we would look, love to look at entering into other relationships with the county for key projects, whether it's parks, whether it's recreation, other tourism related things such as airports and so forth that do bring visitors to the town, support lodging, support businesses in various activities. When, when will the, the new um, hotel be finished? Their, their original goal was the end of this year. I just think in terms of general construction time frame, it'll probably be early 2019. Yeah. Most of our hotels recently, the last two, took about 15 months. And based on when it started, that would put it opening late January, early February. And, uh, and to put you on the spot, um, any new ones in the conversation? Um, we are currently uh, in the process of having three feasibilities studies done for the market to determine uh, additional hotels. Those are all located at, uh, would be south of the city of Salisbury. A lot of interest is timing with the completion of 85 water sewer. Is and that you doing that or is that private um, hotel owners doing that? It's both. Okay, good. 
Um, we restructured the executive officer position at the Tourism Authority about four and a half years ago and made hotel recruitment part of the, the job, and then that's when we went to the Marriott Express and the- Why are you doing that? It's simple, it grows the, well, it grows your tax base too, both property and sales, but also grows our revenue stream as well. Um, this is the uh, request coming forth to the Board of Commissioners for your consideration. Um, Commissioner Pierce uh, has been a, a very engaged in this process and could probably also answer any questions uh, in addition to the ones that, are, that you may as a board have or questions related to the project. The project itself, just to restate, through all of the necessary local government approvals has been completed. And I like that you put Commissioner Caskey in the doorway there. Yeah. Looking sharp, Mike. <laughs> A security. <laughs> why, why didn't you just tear the building down? Uh, the reason we did not tear the building down was twofold. Um, number one was the weight. Um, demolition was not going to be approved. Um, then a, at least a minimum year moratorium would have been put on anything related to the project uh, by the Historic Preservation Commission because it would be a demolition. Uh, but they're happy with this. Yes, this was proof. We, uh, when we began this project, we knew that it would have a lot of opinions. So we intentionally reached out to Historic Salisbury Foundation. We had walkthroughs. We had site visits. We had uh, various approvals. It was a longer road, and it is a more costly road, um, to say the least. Um, what is being done is the facade is being preserved and widened, and just for... Let me escape this. I'll show you what has to be. Basically, a steel brace. You can see some of the remnants of it on the outside. A steel frame has to be put up behind the wall to preserve the facade, then expanded. The part behind it will be quick. That is pure demolition and just go straight up. But it is the part in the front that will take time and is more costly. But uh, our board felt it was a good gesture and a good compromise to protect the originality of the district and the community. Um, but we would be on, we'd still be waiting about another nine months before we could start the project if we had to demolish it. And we'd like to proceed forward with it as quickly as possible. What's your timeline, James? Uh, timeline construction bill would be four to five months. If approved by the commission today, uh, we would proceed with the bid opening. We would enter into agreement. Once the final price would be agreed upon, we'd begin construction process, work with the county related to funding. If it needed to be bridged over to the next fiscal year, we could technically, we could probably carry that if we had to. Um, depending on when you as a board want to decide to, if you approve this, to remit funds, then we would look at completion in around Labor Day. Okay, thank you. Yep. James, would you touch on the fact that this is going to be uh, vehicle friendly to, to get traffic back to uh, the rail walk area, Morgan Ridge, uh, because currently you have to go down that pothole ridden street that's there beside the auction company and this will allow traffic to move in and out of that area traffic in through here yeah, it's yeah so um mr <clears throat> commissioner pierce brings up an excellent point that when this is not being utilized for events um it will be public because it'll be owned by the tourism authority and it will provide access the width the current width is this and it is going to this. This current width meets DOT standards actually for two lane traffic, but we're, we're going to restrict it to singular lane traffic uh, or singular lane access. It'll be up to 24 feet wide and um, it will preserve the, the nature of the facade. And, and, and the one benefit of, of Car Street, it is a controlled process. The street's not a, a full highway or thoroughfare, although sometimes it does serve as a bypass, it seems, for Inner Street. Um, but we have worked with the city regarding the planning of this. Uh, it's been approved for process moving forward. And we will actually, right now it's a straight sidewalk. You can see up front, uh, brick etched in will be flush with the road so people can make turns in there. And the bollards are on the left and right to prevent people from hitting the structure. And part of that was to increase, one, the ability for existing businesses, Lee Street Theater, Morgan Ridge, and the Emporium to increase sales and activity. Obviously it's important for all of us. But there are, there's an additional 10,000 plus square feet of space in the back that uh, Rowan Investment does want to move forward eventually with further redevelopment, which would improve the tax base, job base, sales tax base as well. So this is, the Tourism Authority sees this as a centerpiece in a larger multi-block development destinational project. And then in addition to that, 
with rail passenger service increasing from four to six over the next couple of years, we're looking at connecting it to the train station to encourage more visitation and more flows through the district as well. This is off the topic, but do you know if there's any plan to fix that gravel pothole road or whatever you call it between the Emporium and the rail road tracks? No, because that's owned by the railroad. Oh, God. Hence, one of the, the structural issues of invest, private investment in this area has really reached a critical mass. For the last five years, it's, it's getting close to $4 million plus in private investment. And one of the challenges to continue to grow that investment, to grow the tax base, to grow visitors coming to the area is some infrastructure that is complementary to that, both for events, activities, pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Um, that area has uh, been kind of a long-term area of a challenge, really, because the rail property basically goes right up to the Emporium's sidewalk. And you cannot make alterations to railroad property. Period. A couple of questions, James. <clears throat> it seems like, did we do something similar this last couple of years where we loaned some money to the GDA and was paid back? We did a one time uh, within one fiscal year. That were, we, when we first had the opportunity to land the Little League World Series, okay. it came to us late. And um, the TDA as a whole, really for the last seven years, has intentionally not carried a large fund balance. Uh, the board has felt that its job is to continue to market and promote, and the way we're set up being essentially a, a, a unit of government underneath the county, that if there are large-scale projects like this or the Little League World Series, that if we ever needed to use fund balance, that we would need to approach the county for that purpose. Um, we did that. The Little League World Series approach was really less than three months, and it was at the end of a fiscal year, and they needed a, it was a $40,000 commitment. Uh, it ended up being around 38. The county, we remitted invoice to the county, the county remitted the 38 to us, and then we reimbursed the county within that one fiscal year as a smaller scale project. The best example would be the trolley system. We did, uh, it was a little over $300,000 for the brand new trolleys. We did a, and this was when we had the Salisbury TDA, and all capital ran through that process. We did a seven year repayment for the trolleys with the city of Salisbury. With, in that chart you saw earlier, they're rotating off in fiscal 1819. Um, also, we, I know, I don't know how fair, but I got a call, but there was one citizen that called to ask us to vote I against know. it. And uh, <laughs> now they indicated that the historical board vote was a split vote, but a six to one didn't really seem like a split vote to me. Did, the what? first vote was unanimous, and then uh, actually Historic Salisbury Foundation did speak in favor of it. Um, recognizing that the likelihood of any additional preservation would be limited. The current building actually sits four feet off the ground, and it's an elevated building that was built in 1925 solely for the purpose of trains coming up next to the building, loading in and loading out. It's a 3,100 square foot rectangle that's completely landlocked. Um, in the end, the final vote, also with the alterations to the facade, was six to one. Okay. Well, I mean, why was there, do we know why there was a one vote against it? Um, Majority of votes at HBC that I've seen are, uh, the ch it was actually the chairman who voted initially for it, but voted against it. Um, solely just, I think, for wanted the facade to not have any alterations whatsoever to it. Um, not as much opposed to the project as the, he was opposed to any alterations at all to the facade. Um, but the other, the other members of the commission were in favor of it. Okay. And Commissioner Kasky, what needs to be talked about, and James has eloquently not done that to embarrass anybody, but the building's ready to fall down. I mean, it's not a safe structure the way it stands. So we took a long, hard look at, first of all, before we bought it, is this something we want to take on? And second of all, were we able to convert it to something that's complementary to the surrounding buildings? That's the reason why we're going through the expense of keeping the front facade is to let it maintain its character along with all the other adjacent structures. But literally, it's a tin building. I mean, there's, the, the only thing that's historic about it is it was just built 100 years ago. It's, it's I mean, facade. You know, nobody spent the night there. Nobody had a law practice there or anything like that. It was actually used for battery storage because it used to be a ordinance that you could store batteries in the same building with flammable goods. 
because the old batteries were not sealed top batteries like they are today. So we've done everything that we thought we could to maintain as much integrity of this building structure and still make it safe. And uh, you know that that was a main concern for us if we're going to take on this project and use this for multi-capacity type functions, where it be uh, garden shows or it be a, a band, or that we want to make sure our citizens are safe. And the only way to do that is to bring it up to current building code. The current building does not actually have trusses. It's just a pitched roof held with cables across. That if if we were to leave the side doors open, a uh, wind tunnel would most likely bring it down. Um, we had a structural engineer review the building and they deemed it as not sound or safe. We also, uh, Commissioner Pierce touched on something, we did go through the necessary environmental studies as well uh, and this was determined to be a clean site and a site that we can alter the ground on. Mainly because anything that did occur um, was minimal record of it and anything above, but we did do soil, soil sample testing and everything came back permittable. Uh, we would obviously grade this out, have standard concrete, uh, slab running across it to the road. Okay. Um, well, I guess the last thing that I have, <clears throat> and after hearing what you've had to say, you know, I feel much more comfortable supporting it now, is that I, I don't, <clears throat> as far as um, when you would actually need us, and I guess this is part for you and part for county staff, is when you would actually need us to give you funds, and I don't know that I mean, there was some concern about whether or not it should come out of the economic development funds. How much do we have left there? What's allocated already? I mean, it could come out of fund balance, but I know you asked for specific Well, well and that was a, just a, something we were looking at the project. Ultimately, that is up to you as a board of commissioners to decide that's, that's not the Tourism Development Authority's purview. Um, we do know from what it is doing that, that that was just a source and a suggestion from our part of, of it does meet some of those criteria. Um, in addition to that, you know, this would, the construction of this project would crest over two fiscal years. It would start in the spring and, you know, standard construction that kind of drawdowns and payments. So some of it would start this fiscal year. Some of it would end at the, at the um, beginning of fiscal 18, 19. So it, it, based on the timing of it, you're really looking half the projects in this fiscal year, half the projects in the next. Pending this was approved, we signed an agreement. March 20th, looking to get started the beginning of April. So, so do you only need 150,000 for this fiscal year? Um, that would, I mean, if, if that, or half the project, I mean, if, if the project came in at 312 or 284 or 323, we don't, we will know the final price tomorrow. What I wanted to demonstrate earlier in the previous slide is we have the ability to reimburse up to 90,000 a year for five years starting next fiscal year. So if for some reason we're not projecting that, but if for some reason everything comes in at 375 or 380, we do have the capacity to do that from an interlocal agreement standpoint with this board using occupancy tax revenues. Leslie, wouldn't we sort of do a drawdown schedule anyway? Or would we, for construction, if you're not proposing construction to be complete until Labor Day, we wouldn't fund all 300,000 immediately anyway, would we? What we would propose is as we're invoiced, we would submit invoices similar to what we did yeah. with the World so Series. It's like a drawdown schedule, so yes. we would only pay out as they build up. As we right? get invoices, so to speak, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, would I personally, your I, would, I would not be in favor of you remitting funds up front. I would only want funds remitted if we have an invoice to submit for payment. And so does that make sense? We would create a construction schedule once you award a bid, I'm sure, and then that construction schedule would span this year and next year. Well, your, your contractor is going to give you a takedown schedule yeah. based on its construction yeah. completion. So, I mean, you, you would see Right, it. but typically um, I'm reacting to invoices rather than a drawdown schedule because yeah. I've never seen a construction project yet who's, you know, that's come close to the drawdown schedule. <laughs> No, I would. I, I, this one yeah. will. Well, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's always first ever. But what what I would propose, or from the TDA perspective, is as we're invoiced, mm -hmm. kind of like we did with the World Series, we would submit an invoice to the county. They would be confirmed. The county would remit funds to us, and then we would begin the repayment schedule as defined by the interlocal agreement. Have would, you gotten uh, any bids, or is this all from the the uh, architect? This is all from Ramsey Bergen Smith's estimation uh, and looking at similar projects. Uh, the, the two biggest expenses in this are the front 
and uh, the Department of Insurance's requirement that there is some form of a restroom in the back of this building, as they're calling it a building. Um, we're calling it the Fortress of Solitude because um, it doesn't have to be open to the public, and it's a sing it'll be a single stall restroom uh, built to code. It's already been approved by inspection. Uh, it'll be in the back. I'll show you where that's at. Right there. This would be the restroom, which would have a door on the other side, which when we're doing events, markets, activities, will be a good addition to the site in the long term. For, for activities, but that and the facade are roughly going to be 55% of the cost of the entire project. Well, Les, let me ask you this. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'm mistaken, but I thought that, um, and maybe it's where we have to take the funds from, but isn't there some auditing issues if you take have large just, uh, disbursements that weren't originally um, budgeted? It could affect our audit. Um, you know, as long as the board is approving the budget amendment for this project, I, I don't think there's an issue from that standpoint. Um, we talked a little bit during the retreat that I think revenues and expenditures are um, tight. tight. So, um, you know, this budgeting it this year um, could, could affect that a little bit, and that would be discussed mainly with rating agencies, but I don't see it as a problem with the auditors. Mm -hmm. okay. And obviously, I'm, I'm assuming you would then budget the revenue coming back in from the TDA over the subsequent years, the repayment. So is, are we going to get the funds from uh, the Economic Development Funds? Is that, what, uh, is that where we're looking, or are we just taking it out of fund balance? Or is there a I, preference from you how it works? Well, um, the three of us, uh, James and Aaron and I, we had discussed using the economic uh, development funds. And that is, um, right now, I have money budgeted in a capital project line, um, really carried over from a year ago for the signs, which we're not going to complete in this fiscal year. So this project wouldn't require a budget amendment at this time. If those are the funds we use, yeah, that, that's something the board would have to decide um, if the money money comes from that or the general fund. Could we take it from fund balance? Yes. We could. Yeah, I mean, are are, are is there a, any kind of negative? <coughs> um, I mean, I I just think of you know bang for buck. I mean that. That economic development money is limited, and as projects uh, are beginning to flow our way, um, and I talked with James about this today, you know, when you start looking at bang for buck, I, 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 I don't know if tying, tying up $300,000 on, on that is something that I'd, I'd want to do. Um, we've got a couple of projects out there. You know, one of them, we've got $100,000 earmarked, and it's about 130 jobs and uh, um, a, a whole lot of capital investment. Another one, we've got 250000 earmarked for over 700 jobs and a couple hundred million dollars of investment. So um, th that money becomes pretty, pretty important as we begin to move through, and we don't know what phone call we get from uh, our EDC partners uh, tomorrow, you know, that we'll need to use that money for, uh, for jobs and um, uh, capital investment. I, I'm, you know, I told James today I'm, I'm for doing this. Um, I think it makes sense. I'd, I'd rather pull it out of fund balance and just have them pay that back rather than tie up a limited um, fund that we have in that economic development. We know about how much is coming in every year. Um, so it's just my preference. Yeah. <clears throat> as long as you guys give me direction, I can go either way. And we got a healthy fund balance. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I know this could be seen as an economic development uh, uh, project and, and is, uh, I would 
I would prefer uh, taking money out of the uh, uh, fund rather than r rather than to use economic development money. Um, I would rather tie that to actual jobs than this. And if we decide to take on this project. Craig, is that okay? You know, I think fund balance is the way to go simply because, you know, we're, it's basically this is a bridge loan is all it is. So we're going to take it out of here and then get it back. So to me, as long as they got the money, that's all that I'm after. Okay. Uh, you know, where it comes from, how it's allocated is not critical to me. It, you know, at the end of the day, I hate to sound trivial, but this is not a lot of money. No. Not, not for what we're trying to do here. So uh, fund balance is fine with me. <clears throat> Mike, anything else for James? No, the only, um, well, I guess, <clears throat> so we're approving, uh, I mean, are, are you going to come back when you get the final numbers for the final approval? Or? What we would request would be an interlocal for the funding of the construction project with obviously the final amount will be, we would know that tomorrow. Um, I'm very comfortable with the process as our board would be of just when we get an invoice from the construction firm, we submit that to county finance, that way there's a clear record, transactions. That's how we did when we did the Little League World Series because that was actually linked to hotel room night stays for folks visiting from out of state. Um, that would work for us. And then um, we would just have the interlocal agreement tied to the construction amount and based on our budget capacity, not that I'm thinking it, but would it not exceed 450,000? Because that's our, that's our capacity to do this project, fund it completely uh, and go from there. But I'm not expecting it to come in at that. James, you know, the question I have is who's going to look after this project? Is this going to be something that the architect will handle? Uh, yes, uh, Ramsey, Berg, and Smith, we have actually covered the cost of their services in advance of this. Um, they will be managing the project on site. Obviously, they're just a few blocks away, which is uh, helpful. We sent it out to eight qualified firms. We had, we we're expecting four bids, two local, two non-local. And it'll be lowest qualified bidder will win the bid. So let me back up. I think I heard I heard something different. Are you the numbers we've been looking at have been three hundred thousand. Are you asking us to approve up to four hundred and fifty thousand? I'm not thinking it's gonna come in that. If it would, I'd even go back to my board. But I think to know exactly if it's gonna be three oh one or three twelve or two seventy eight, I don't know that amount. But I would say from our recommendation standpoint, I showed that earlier slide to purely demonstrate capacity if it came in above 300,000 at 312 or 314 or 315. Um, if it is in excess, we could easily set a, if it's in excess of 330 or 340 or 350, we come back and do the final presentation one more time. I don't think there's any issue with that on our front. It's just more demonstrating the capacity with the Tourism Authority to fund the project if, if it's in excess. If it's 50% more than we're projecting, we can still cover the cost of the project. Okay, but, but you understand we're gonna have to put a dollar amount that we're approving tonight. So are you asking for 350? I guess the easiest mechanism would be an up to, up to. amount within mm -hmm. an interlocal. Mm -hmm. Then I would say up to 350 would be an easy agreement interlocal. And if for some reason it needed to be amended, it'd be the responsibility of the TDA board to bring that back to the Board of Commissioners for consideration. Okay. Any other questions for James? I'd just like to make sure that everybody understands that we are not getting in the building business um, in downtown Salisbury, and that I can't believe that James got this approved already by all the authorities <laughs> that regulate building in Salisbury. Um, it was not easy. I can't imagine uh, having labor looked, of love having to <laughs> looked at this particular area in my personal opinion is that it's going to make a great improvement to that particular area but that's just a, a, a personal opinion um, but the, the county is only making a loan on this they will not own any of this property correct the property will, will stay solely owned by the tourism authority I think our board did a very good job of striking balance between preservation, economic development, redevelopment, and felt the need to go through that process. That's why it, it took time. Uh, it took engagement, and we specifically did that engagement. And I think historic preservation really commission looked at this thoroughly. They, they went through the motions of this. They understood it. Uh, and I think that's at the end why we were able to clear um, the important approval processes we needed. 
just as a note to you guys, um, your inspection department was fantastic to work with on this project. I just thought y'all should know that we had very quick turnaround. Good. It's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, two quick things. I hope that you'll be able to, Mr. Kettner, figure out something on that shed in the middle that connects uh, this building in the Emporium. Um, Someone but, else's property. I, I know, I know, <laughs> but uh, that that still, uh, still, property. yeah, still the eyesore. You're referring to this. Yeah, I, I knew that, yeah, I knew that. And secondly, now I know why Spencer is here tonight, because evidently there's a sign-up sheet It'll be available afterwards from James at which community he moves to next. So uh, you you guys are here to get your name on there first, aren't you, Mr. Mayor? <laughs> I've seen them back there kind of rubbing their hands, so, uh, so now I know. All right, well, thank you. Uh, do we have a motion to approve up to $350,000 uh, loan uh, to the TDA to be repaid over five years? And uh, that, that would come from fund balance. Do we have a motion? No move. All right, thank you. Do we have a second? Second. All right, any further discussion? Yes. Um, I do support this project, and Commissioner Green and I just happened to meet down there this afternoon, and we both agreed that if we opened the doors at each end, the wind probably would take it. <laughs> but, um, no, I... I think it's going to be a huge improvement in the rail walk area. And I do believe, too, that we need to take this out of fund balance rather than our economic development dollars. And one more time, I'm going to say, as my other colleagues have, is this is a loan. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, James. Thank you guys for your consideration and support. Thank you for your presentation. Ms. Leslie. Um, again, I have the same types of graphs in front of you. Um, the, the first shows annual cumulative revenue comparisons through the month of February um, in 2018, which is the current fiscal year, we have received $103.8 million. And um, for the four years that are represented, that, rep that accounts for 74% of budget across all four years. So that's... Um, this, uh, is this property tax revenue? No, that that is all revenues. All revenues. So, okay, because I had read from someone recently that our, our revenues were down, but that's not the case. Our revenues aren't down. The, um, there is a, There are slots for sales tax and property tax coming up. Yeah. And what you're going to see is that um, as a percent of budget, it's tighter there. Yeah, yeah. No, I just read somewhere, I don't recall, that tax revenues for the whole county are, are down. And I didn't think that was the case. But uh, here we see that we're about $6.8 million higher uh, than, uh, than it has been. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, the next graph shows the cumulative expenditure comparisons. Um, to date, we have spent $87.6 million, and um, so for the four years shown, that represents 56 to 57 percent of expenditures, of budgeted expenditures. Um, and again, in the second half of the year is where, um, when we borrow money for um, bonds in particular, in the first half of the year, you're only paying interest. You make semi-annual payments, but the, in the first part of the year, it's only interest. In the second part of the year, um, you also have principal payments. So whereas first part of the year might be, the, this is coming up for the month of April, a um, million dollar in all debt payments, you know, six months prior to April, and April will be five times, that'll be 
roughly $5 million. So the larger expenditures are coming. Um, the next graph, this is property taxes and, um, and what this is showing is that um, what we've collected during the month of January is very similar to prior years. Um, through January, we've collected $72.7 million this year. And uh, for comparison purposes, a year ago it was $71.5 million. So although revenues are up, um, a year ago that was 94% of budget, and this year it's 92%. I have that reversed this year. No, it was 94% last year. It's 92% this year. It just means that our revenue projection is more on target. Um, and then the last slide shows sales tax. Um, sales taxes, again, are all over the place throughout the year. Um, we received in the month of November $2 million. A year before, we received $1.9 million. Revenues from sales tax through four months are up by 3%. Cumulatively. Christmas shopping should be the next one we get, huh? Um, yes, you're right. All right, any questions for Leslie? Leslie, thank you. You're welcome. All right, next item is budget amendments. We're provided for us. Do we have a motion to accept? So move. All right, second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, we are going to move into closed session. Nope. Wait, wait, wait. Nope. As nope. soon as we're done with. <laughs> <laughs> Good save. As soon as we're done with. Man, I got so excited because <laughs> it's been a long night. This will go quick. Uh, 10 A. All right, uh, 10A was, uh, we had moved item in from 10A. Uh, Commissioner Pierce. Yes, sir. Um, commissioners, this is just mainly housekeeping. It's, it's no big issue, I don't think, but we'll see. Um, Aaron and I have been in close conversations with DOT trying to figure out what's been taking so long to get the uh, agreement with the uh, construction for the casements, which we've already approved. And through a lot of investigation, we found out that it has to do a lot with their, their paperwork and, and their lack of doing their job properly. That's basically what it comes down to. But we received, and I appreciate you putting this back on the agenda, but we received information today that they're ready to give us an agreed upon contract for the monies that we approved. So I didn't want us to pass this to put it back out for bid when tomorrow we're going to have what we needed all along. So that's why I pulled it off, and I'm just asking that we go ahead and, and, and I'd like to make a motion that if the contract comes in from DOT this week that is within the parameters of what we agreed upon to have the county manager execute that contract, if not, to have it put back to put this out for bid. It's just mainly to speed the process up because we passed this in January. Here it is fixed to be April, and we still haven't got it moved forward. So that's why I pulled it off. I get that. We had uh, we all received an email from uh, Aaron that we had uh, finally gotten bid that fell within the numbers that we were given. Um, I'd ask Aaron, well, pff, do we just leave that item on there, and uh, does it hurt anything to go out to bid ourselves if we get a lower price? But I understand what you're saying; it could delay it further. Uh, so I'm willing to pull it off. Um, if the sense of the board is to do that, and if something gets backed up with DOT, we can put it back on. Is that what you want to that do? That was my motion, yes, sir. All right. I, I'll, I'll second that. Expecting this quote literally tomorrow. Tomorrow. That was the email we got from Doug Chapman. And you said if we don't get it, then to go out. Did you say go out to bids if we yeah, don't if, get it? If, if by the end of the week, this Friday, if we haven't received a contract that's within the parameters of what we voted to approve, then I'd like to put this back on the consent agenda for our next meeting and let it go out to bid. I got you. So pull, pull it off and then we'll, we'll wait to see. 
Uh, but if we vote tonight to put it out for bid, then we got to put it out I, for bid. Yeah, I understand that. Um, can we can we uh, approve to go out to bid contingent on not receiving? No. Okay, that's fine. We, we don't need to muddle it. That's fine. Um, you made a motion to pull it off, and I'll second that. Um, yeah, you did. I'm sorry. Two, two weeks doesn't Let the, seem to bother the state one way or another. So. Well, two months don't bother them. So I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> let, let the record show that Commissioner Klusman seconded uh, that item. All right, and any other discussion? Everyone okay with that? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you, Commissioner Pierce. Hey, can I, uh, can we go to closed session now? Sure. <laughs> all right. It's on the agenda. I know. <laughs> All right, uh, I move the board enter closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A3 for attorney-client privilege communication regarding legal counsel for potential opioid litigation and 143-318-11A2 to prevent the premature disclosure of an honorary award. Uh, do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we'll get started as soon as the room clear clears. It's a long, hey guys, thank you for being. Yes. Reverb radio on the call. All right, we on? All right, we are out of closed session, and Commissioner Klusman has a resolution for us. Uh, please. Resolution to take action to abate a public nuisance. Whereas Rowan County Board of Commissioners has the authority to adopt resolutions with respect to county affairs of Rowan County, North Carolina, pursuant to North Carolina General Statutes 153A-121, and whereas the Rowan County Board of Commissioners has the authority to take action to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of the residents and citizens of Rowan County, and whereas there exists a serious public health and safety crisis involving opioid abuse, addiction, morbidity, and mortality in Rowan County, and whereas the diversion of legally produced controlled subsidence into the illicit market causes or contributes to the serious public health and safety crisis involving opioid abuse, addiction, morbidity, and mortality in Rowan County, and whereas the opioid crisis unreasonably interferes with rights common to the general public of Rowan County, involves a significant interference with the public health, safety, peace, comfort, and convenience of citizens and residents of Rowan County, includes the delivery of controlled substance, substance, substances in violation of state and federal law, and regulations and therefore constitutes a public nuisance. And whereas the opioid crisis is having an extended and far reaching impact on the general public health and safety of residents and citizens of Rowan County and must be abated. And whereas the violation of any, any laws of the state of North Carolina or of the United States of America controlling the distribution of a controlled substance in inimical, harmful, and adverse to the public welfare of the residents and citizens of Rowan County constituting a public nuisance. And whereas the Rowan County Board of Commissioners has the authority to abate or cause to be abated any public nuisance, including those acts that unreasonably interfere with rights common to the general public of Rowan County and or involve a significant interference with the public health, safety, peace, comfort, and convenience of citizens and residents of Rowan County. And whereas Rowan County has expended, is expending, and will continue to expend in the future county funds to respond to the serious public health and safety crisis involving opioid abuse, addiction, morbidity, and mortality within Rowan County, and whereas the Rowan County Board of Commissioners has received information that indicates that the manufacturers and wholesale distributors of controlled subsidence have distributed in areas around Rowan County, North Carolina, and may have violated federal and or state laws 
and regulations that were enacted to prevent the diversion of legally produced controlled substance, substances into the illicit market. And now, therefore, be it resolved by the Rowan County Board of Commissioners assembled on this day at which a quorum is present that based upon the above, the Rowan County Board of Commissioners are declaring the opioid crisis a public nuisance which must be abated for the benefit of Rowan County and its residents and citizens. This the 19th day of March 2018. All right, and so you offer up that resolution uh, as a motion and also to retain uh, the power group at a 25% fee uh, with a 10% cap on expenses. Is that, is that your motion? Yes, sir. All right. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Thank you. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I'd just like for the public to know that that fee is only if we win the case. There is no cost to the county moving forward that we're not paying 25% of cost or anything unless we win our case. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, very good clarification. Anything else? All right, then all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Go, out of, go home. All so right, moved. we have a motion, second? Adjourn and go home, say All in aye. favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs>